York City, I'm Shauna Smith alongside Brad Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief. The ultimate guide to help investors make smarter decisions for their portfolios. We're tracking early session volume while bringing you today's top market themes and elevating Yahoo Finance's most popular newsletter. A hearty happy Monday to everyone out there. Stock futures are higher as investors await the latest interest rate decision from the Fed. That's to come this week, Wednesday. All eyes will be on the Fed's dot plot for insight into the number of rate cuts expected this year. We're also watching Treasury yields that ticking higher as the Bank of Japan also set to make a policy decision this week that could have ripple effects across the bond market. It certainly could. And Yahoo Finance is on the move. We are live from NVIDIA's AI conference, dubbed the Woods Woodstock Festival of AI by Bank of America last week. And we've also got the latest on big oil and energy from Sarah Week by S&P Global in Houston, Texas. So let's get right to it. The three things that you need to know your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, Dan Halley, and Madison Mills have more. Hey, Shauna. Futures are higher this morning ahead of this week's Federal Reserve meeting. The central bank is not expected to cut rates in March as inflation has remained sticky and the job market remains resilient. All eyes will be on the Fed's latest summary of economic projections, also known as the dot plot, which is expected to give investors insight into the Fed's expectations for rate cuts later this year. AI darling NVIDIA kicks off its GTC conference right here in San Jose with a keynote starting at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern from CEO Jensen Huang. We're expected to learn more about what the company has cooking for the year ahead and get a sneak peek at some of its latest products. And Apple is reportedly in talks with Google to build its Gemini artificial intelligence engine into the iPhone. That's according to a Bloomberg News report. Now, the deal would give Google access to billions of users on iOS. It also puts Apple back into the AI race, one that some analysts have said the company has stalled in. Futures rising this morning ahead of the Fed's March meeting later on this week. Now, investors eagerly awaiting the release of the Fed's quarterly dot plot to give some insight on the Fed's rate cut expectations. Optimism for an early cut is waning after recent data show that inflation remains sticky. Goldman Sachs cutting its rate cut forecast to three cuts down from four. So can this week's meeting bring some momentum back to the markets? We want to bring in Brent Schutte. He's Northwestern Mutual's wealth management company chief investment officer. Brent, it's great to have you here. So the setup here heading into the Fed decision on Wednesday, of course, that focus is going to be on the dot plot. What are you expecting to hear? And then how should investors position themselves ahead of that? Yeah, so I think a lot of the rally that we've seen since late October of last year has been uh, positioned on or based upon the premise that the Fed would cut rates aggressively. And you're right, you have seen that dialed back, and I think you'll continue to see that dialed back. I expect Chair Powell to be a bit more hawkish. You're seeing inflation move in the wrong direction. And so last week's CPI, for example, you saw the median uh, CPI from the Cleveland Fed. It pushed higher. You've seen sticky CPI push higher. And the services side, which is so key and so vital to getting inflation lower, it actually bottomed on a year-over-year -year basis last July, August area, and it's been moving higher since, even when you exclude shelter, which has kind of been the, the fly in the ointment. And so to me, all in all, I expect a more hawkish Fed, and I expect the market to have some difficulty because it's been based upon uh, a more dovish Fed, which we've seen in the past. And, and so with that in mind, Brent, as we're kind of also lingering on every word that Powell has to say in the press conference afterwards, what do you think it is that the markets would pay most attention to at this juncture? I think a lot of the confidence in what he's looking for, and to me, he looks for the data, and the data, as I mentioned before, aren't supporting that. And so to me, it's, it's more along the lines of what does he think, what picture does he paint of the future? And he's been expressing confidence, saying rate cuts are around the corner. Uh, and to me, I think that keeps getting pushed out further. And the Fed dot plot could only show two rate hikes, which I think would be kind of uh, a rate cuts, I should say, you saying heights last couple of years, <laughs> rate cuts for 2024, which I think would obviously uh, be a bit of a, a shock to investors. Well, what do you think of just overall valuations? Here we are not too far from the record highs. Of course, a lot of the focus on the AI frenzy is going to be placed on what we hear from NVIDIA over the coming days. How do you see that playing into the market's momentum here? And how much is it that that is the driving factor versus what the Fed does? Well, I think the Fed ultimately becomes important because they're going to end up causing a recession. And I haven't seen too many markets that do well during recessions. And so that, I think that's you know obviously more important uh, longer term. What path does the economy uh, take? 
Uh, to me, the market's expensive in, in many parts of it, especially when you see bond yields opposite that are now attractive. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think the good news, though, is that there are parts of the market that have already discounted or been paying attention to and paying heed to a recession, such as small and mid cap stocks, which I'm not suggesting won't go down if there is a recession. But I think much like what happened post 2000, 2001, where you had a very similar setup with large caps drawing in investors attention, people wanting to concentrate there. The, the next, you know, five, six, seven years, that next economic cycle were much better for small, mid value and even international stocks. Would, would a major pullback, Brent, be more due to recession or more due to a, a bursting of a, an AI thematic bubble? Could be each. Um, I think to me, more so along the lines of the pullback is more along the lines of recession. And I think perversely, it's probably hit its hardest in those top names. Look, um, if we wake up five years from now and the same theme is out there, it'd be highly unlikely that that would occur. History would suggest that's not going to be the case. AI is probably like the internet of the past. I think we're still unknown who's going to win. I think it's going to be a big theme. Uh, but today's winners won't necessarily be tomorrow's winners. And every economic cycle in the past, going back to 1981, has had different leadership in the next economic cycle. Uh, and that's where I want investors to make sure they stay diversified because no one knows for certain what the next theme is. And at least historically at the end of the cycle, like we are right now, where you see this blow off top, uh, typically the leaders of the past cycle become the laggards of the next cycle. It, it was really interesting. There was some data out from FactSet at the end of last week that said that we've reached the second highest number of S&P 500 companies citing AI on earnings calls over the past 10 years, they go further and say the information technology sector had the highest number, 52, and, and percentage, 85% of companies citing AI on Q4 earnings calls. How long do you believe that continues to be one of the prevailing themes here? I think, I think the theme stays. I think the question is who wins. Uh, and so to me, that's, that's where I, every time I come on these shows and I hear the AI stuff and I hear whatever, I kind of find it hard to believe it does for 30 years, but I have flashbacks to 2000. And I think, you know, the good news for you all is in the next, you know, three or four or five years, you're going to be talking about something different because everything changes in each economic cycle. And what was in short supply or in kind of short investor demand, the last cycle becomes the next kind of thematic thing that you're going to see in the future. Uh, AI probably stays as a driving theme, just like the internet did. But 01 to 07 saw very different leadership from those AI names. In fact, technology stocks back then were the kind of cause of the U.S. large cap market pushing to new highs, to record highs uh, in 2000. Uh, I want investors to remember it took 17 years for the tech sector post-2000 to make new highs. It took Microsoft, I believe, 15, 16, 17 years to make new highs. It doesn't mean they're bad companies. They're actually great companies. The Internet became a real thing. Uh, but was it already priced in? And that's where I think we're at today. All right. Well, if there's any truth to what Elon Musk was telling Don Lemon in the uh, interview that aired this morning, maybe we'll be talking about flying cars in the next two to five years. Who knows? Could be. Yeah. Brent, thanks so much for taking the time here this morning. Thank really you. appreciate it. Definitely. Northwestern Mutual Management Company CIO, Brent Schutte. Also, everyone, we're tracking NVIDIA shares this morning. They're ticking higher in the pre-market as analysts boost the company's price target ahead of its annual GTC conference. Our very own tech editor, Dan Halley, is live from the conference in San Jose, California, where the sun has not even hit the streets. But our own Dan is out there bringing us what we can expect. Dan, what are you going to be listening for? Yeah, right. Uh, right now, I'm uh, hoping to get my hands warm at some point. It's uh, not quite sun up yet, but what we're going to be expecting to hear is mostly about the big new products that NVIDIA will have on offer in the year ahead. Uh, a lot of the rumors point to a new GPU for them, uh, a new architecture. Right now, their top of the line products are the H100 and the H200. Uh, they have their own super chip, which is the uh, Grace Hopper super chip. Uh, we're expected to get something called a Blackwell chip. That's uh, what various reports have pointed to. Uh, there's also uh, the possibility that we could hear more uh, about different partnerships as well as how they expect AI to kind of permanently throughout various industries uh, throughout the year. This is obviously their biggest GTC to date, mostly because of the hype from the, the AI boom that we've started to see or we've been seeing uh, kicked off in 2022 with uh, ChatGPT. Uh, and as you said, uh, price targets are going up on NVIDIA as the conference gets ready to go out. We have uh, we have Matt Byer, uh, Bryson from uh, Webbush. He's jumped up to $1,000 from $850. Uh, we have Truist Securities. They've jumped up from nine, uh, $911 to $1,177. Uh, we have uh, 
William Stein, uh, that's from William Stein. We have HSBC. They jumped from 880 to 1050 uh, for the price target. And that's conference hasn't even started yet. So we'll see what happens afterwards. Uh, you know, AI obviously huge in the news. We uh, mentioned the, uh, earlier when uh, Maddie had put uh, 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 her thoughts in on the uh, Apple and Google uh, potential tie up there. So it's not going away anytime soon. It's certainly not. All right, Dan Halley, we will uh, get back to you shortly. Good luck today. Big day for you. And a lot of investors out there, too. All right, well, Apple reportedly in talks with Google to use its generative AI engine, Gemini, on its iPhones. This is according to a report from Bloomberg. Now, this comes after Apple also reportedly held conversations with OpenAI to use its product. Now, this is huge news within the AI space, really within the tech space more broadly here, Brad. If, in fact, this partnership does go through, it really totally would shake up the AI world. A couple of things, though, to bring up. Obviously, a partnership here with Apple and Google, it would be a huge advantage for Google. You're getting access, you're getting exposure to the number of users that Apple has. But it also brings up the fact that, hey, maybe Apple isn't as advanced as many thought that they might mm. have been potentially up until this point on some of their AI efforts. So you've got to also question what this could mean for AI and or for Apple, excuse me, and their AI plans more broadly speaking, in the longer run. Yeah, putting generative AI at the fingertips of those two billion devices that are out in market for Apple iPhones here. And it's important to also note that these companies have had deals in the past, whether that's for search mm -hmm. on the iPhones. We do know that Google is the default search engine. And then you can go in and kind of download your other uh, search engines as well, whatever you would like to use on most of these devices. But this is really critical, I think, for how the data sharing as well across both of these companies would move forward. Um, because you do have a trove of data that would be indexed as you would perceive for any generative AI type of co-pilot or tool that would be embedded within it, or if it's just embedded within some of the existing operating systems and, and apps that are on there. I don't know how they're going to go about doing this, but it's another reason for me to perhaps delay upgrading my iPhone, which we've already, you see my cracked screen every day. <laughs> At this juncture, I, I'm just waiting for the next generative AI major announcement to come forward so that I know that that's the device that I have to get into here. Yeah, I, exactly. And I think a lot of people are out there scratching their heads trying to figure out exactly what this means, what yeah. the technology is going to be hold, whether or not they should be staying on the sidelines and waiting for these new applications and what exactly that would then uh, enable some of these uh, iPhones to do. But real quick, just looking at this early uh, reaction that we're getting from some analysts out there. Uh, Webbush analyst Dan I saying that this strategic partnership is a missing piece in the Apple AI strategy. It's a major win for Google to get onto the Apple ecosystem, similar to what we were talking about uh, just a second ago there, Brad. And then Melius Research was also saying that this news represents a bigger immediate win for Apple, who can use that asset light approach to aspects of its AI strategy and then therefore potentially acquire another form of overall traffic acquisition payments there. So they're viewing it as a huge win here for Apple and for Alphabet. And then that's a big reason why we're seeing both of these stocks move to the upside here in pre-market trading. Yeah, huge move for Alphabet in that this is now access into a device ecosystem that mm -hmm. you didn't necessarily, and outside of the, the existing partnerships, you were looking to expand upon more. And so for Google and, and Af Alphabet, what they've been able to do with the Android OS, and they've already got that part of the market, now it's just about, okay, how do we get even more entrenchment mm -hmm. into the Apple operating system, an ecosystem that we don't power, but uh, we can be a net benefactor of as well. Certainly, all right, well, let's stick with the AI theme here this morning. We want to get to one of the trending tickers that we are watching. That is Qualcomm showing its commitment to the generative AI space, announcing its newest smartphone chip. Now, the Snapdragon 8S Gen 3 is going to be available on Android smartphones. The company really positioning the chip as a generative AI processor. Now, this new chip is meant to bring generative AI to more affordable smartphones. Shares are moving higher on this announcement. You're looking at a gain of just about 2% here in the pre-market. But again, this 8S Gen 3 aiming to bring generative AI to devices here, more affordable phones representing a new tier for this top of the line 8 series that we know Qualcomm has been focused on over the last several years and looking forward here they're saying that it's going to be able to support multi-model generative AI on device and also can run those large language models of up to 10 billion parameters so again extremely powerful uh, chip here what exactly this means then for getting more AI capabilities within smartphones similar to the discussion that we were just having with Apple and Google and their partnership there. Yeah, this 
has been a standout period for Qualcomm to really prove themselves to the market right now, doing so early this year, up by about 19% year to date. And if you take that out over the past year, the company is up by about 37%. I think one of the other critical things that caught investors' attention at least a few weeks ago to begin March was the increase in the dividend as well. And so going forward now, major partnerships like this also continuing to make sure that the street is not fearful of any type of major shift in the relationship with Apple, all of these things considered. And we were able to speak with the CFO of Qualcomm to really kind of dive in on what the implications of that relationship plus making sure that it's investing further in its research and development. I think that CapEx is most notably as well, something that at a time like this where there's heavy investment uh, that needs to be put forward, keeping pace with the industry innovation that Qualcomm isn't overspending, but also isn't missing out on opportunity. This is a clear opportunity that they've identified, and we'll see how it's brought to market. Certainly is. All right, shares moving to the upside here, up just about 2% in pre-market trading. All right, keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. Coming up, Cisco CFO Scott Heron is going to join us here on set, talking about the completion of their acquisition of Splunk, what it does to the company's bottom line. Scott Heron joins us right after the break. Cisco has officially completed its $28 billion acquisition of Splunk. This comes after the company won approval from the European Commission, who said in a statement that the transaction would not raise competition concerns. Scott Heron, Cisco CFO, joins us now for more on the deal. Scott, great to see you live in living color in person here in Yahoo Finance Studio. You too, Brad and, or Brad and Shauna. It's, it's got, nice to get a chance to meet you. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, Thanks for so having us in today. The European Commission giving the green light here. So what next and how immediately accretive do you see this deal? 
still being to the business. Yeah, we talked a bit about that. When we, so we made this announcement, if you recall, back in September, and we've been in regulatory approval. Um, this is a deal that's going to build a lot of value for our customers mm -hmm. and for our shareholders, which is a, it, it's, it's a great combination to get both of those. Um, what we talked about then is outside of the cash that's required to actually, for the transaction itself, this will be cash flow accretive in its first year. Mm. Uh, and then beyond that, it'll be, of course, gross margin accretive and, and accretive to the bottom line from fiscal 26 on. So it's a, it's a very attractive deal for our customers, but it's also a very attractive deal for shareholders. You've got the first line in this release saying that Cisco is now uniquely poised to power, protect, and advance the AI revolution here for customers. Talk to us just about how this will, in the longer run, change the view not only for investors but customers when it comes to Cisco and the real difference that this is going to make to Cisco's bottom line. Yeah, if you think about the world we live in today with both AI and digital transformation, mm -hmm. what companies need to do is be able to deliver um, to different places, to devices, to people, to um, data that they've got. Mm -hmm. And we're pretty uniquely positioned to not only do that with the networking, the breadth of our networking and security portfolio, but add Splunk to that, uh, no one's going to be able to actually pull that combination of resources together in the way that Cisco can. I, I think it's a, a game changer for us. And so now as you think about the, the Cisco operations going forward and, and what a, because we were speaking with a, a chief investment officer earlier who was in, reintroducing the R word for many people out there in recession. Mm -hmm. In a recession, would you expect the spending profile for some of your core, your biggest customers out there to materially change? How have you modeled that into the business too? Yeah, you know, what the, the, the forces of that kind of the revolution around AI that I think has become much more tangible in the wake of the large language models in Chad GPT, which suddenly made AI very approachable, very real for, for people across the board. I think companies see that as well. Obviously, there's no, you know, there's no AI without data, there's no data without uh, a network, and there's no network without security. Right. So I think it, it really positions us quite well to power both the, the rest of the digital transformation, but also this revolution in AI. What does that scale opportunity look like? When you take a look at Splunk specifically, it was already profitable. They've been focused on cutting costs here most recently. What does that scale opportunity look like outside of the U.S. when you take a look at that global footprint? Yeah, it, it's one of the most attractive yeah. parts of this transaction. We talked about it when we did the when we made the announcement back yeah. in September of last year. They still do the vast majority of the Splunk do the yeah. vast majority of their revenues here in the United mm -hmm. States. And our ability to leverage our, our international footprint, but also our international partner community, is a huge potential upside for us. So when you look at, at what motivated this, mm -hmm. besides a great fit culturally and a great fit for, with uh, the product sets without much overlap, it's a chance to drive revenue synergies much more deeply, both for Cisco and mm -hmm. for Splunk. Um, when we think back to some of the, the fiscal second quarter earnings results that, that you reported, twenty-eight or twelve point eight billion dollars in revenue, that, that was down six percent year over year. Where is the recovery if it's starting to emerge for the business on the revenue basis and how that translates through to the rest of the margins for the business? Yeah, the, the headwind that we saw in the quarter, there were really kind of three headwinds. There is some macro impact right now. It's 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 hard to, to parse that out, but there is clearly some macro impact, and what we see is really more cautiousness from customers. Not necessarily, a, hey, I've got to batten down the hatches, but let's be a bit more cautious. And so that's elongating sales cycles a bit. That was one of the effects. We also, you know, coming through the pandemic with all the supply chain concerns that, that both we had and everyone in the industry had, our supply chain team is world class. You know, number one in the world for the last three years. They cleared our supply chain issues really quickly. Hmm. And what that meant is the bottleneck that we had where we had a lot of customer orders that we couldn't deliver, because of supply constraints, we're able to deliver that really quickly. And so the bottleneck on manufacturing became a bottleneck of implementation at our customers. And they're working their way through that. And we've got an ability to monitor that. That's still going on. And then the third piece is just the service provider segment, which for us is cable, telco, and the big public clouds. Also, different dynamics in each right. of those three, but also have, you know, not, not being robust at this point. And that's the, the three things. As we look ahead, you know, the things that we just talked about, the ability to deliver capability to people, to places, to devices, and do it in a secure way with the combination of Cisco and Splunk, it's going to position us ahead of everyone else in the marketplace. Scott, what do you just make of the AI frenzy right now that's going on? Comparing that to the fact that you have been in this business for decades, how does it compare to some of the excitement that you've seen play out 
previously, and what does that then tell us, because of that big difference, about what we could see growth-wise in the coming years? Yeah, frenzy is a really good word for that, Shauna. It's yours, not mine. It's a really good word for it. But I think it, it has been, AI has been around, yeah. right? AI is not new. I think what has created this kind of, this, this frenzy uh, right now is the, the ability for people to actually grasp the, the capabilities of the technology, and particularly with large language models and what you see from ChatGPT and Gemini, I saw you had Gemini a discussion on earlier, that the ability to, to make it accessible to mere mortals, right? Mm -hmm. People like us to understand it, that's what's driving this. And I think companies see the, the same thing. And as they look at that and, and try to decide, so how am I gonna pursue an opportunity to make my products better, to make my operations more efficient, there's some that they want to do in the big public clouds, mm -hmm. but there's also a lot of very sensitive data they don't want to push up to the cloud, and they're going to want to build that out in the enterprise. And so our partnership with NVIDIA is really about that. It's about bringing together two market leaders to be able to deliver to an enterprise an AI capability in a box. You know, it's, it's interesting you bring up the partnership with NVIDIA. That's naturally where my mind went as we've got our own Dan Howley that's outside of the, uh, the SAP Center out there in San Jose, and uh, the sun hasn't even hit there yet, but we, we're sure that there's gonna be a lot of conversation about partnerships like yours. Mm -hmm. When you think about that partnership, it is beneficial to Cisco if that partnership does what? what? What is it that you look to achieve through a partnership like that, and how does that become beneficial to your business too? Yeah, I think, again, I think the opportunity in the enterprise, there's been a lot written about the opportunity to build out AI infrastructure in the big public clouds, and you see them very aggressively doing that, right? All the big names that you and I could, could name off quickly are doing that very aggressively. Mm -hmm. The next wave will be, and it'll be driven by what I talked about in security, yeah. but the next wave will be a significant build out of AI capabilities inside enterprises because they need to protect certain elements of data that they don't necessarily want to ship up to the public cloud. That's a huge opportunity for us. And so that partnership with NVIDIA brings together one of the market leaders, of course, in the GPU phase uh, with a market leader in both networking and security. The combination of those two really delivers everything you have to have to have to build out both a training and inference ca capacity inside the enterprise. Scott Heron, we have to leave it there. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us here on set. Congratulations, a big day for Cisco at the completion of your acquisition of Splunk. Thanks so much, Scott. Thanks for having me. Great to see you both. You too. All right, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We're just about three minutes until the opening bell on the street. You're taking a look at the futures, pointing to the upside here just ahead of the open. We'll be right back.
Yes, yes. Big opening bell energy this Monday. You've got eyes, lips, and faces all up in the NYSC at the New York Stock Exchange as Elf rings the opening bell there. Great cosmetics company. Also, let's take a look at the NASDAQ. You've got that on the right side of your screen. That looks like a Decepticon logo. We'll figure that out and workshop it a little bit here. But the company name, that's too. Ticker symbol CISS -S, ringing the opening bell in Midtown Manhattan in Times Square. All right, there you've got the opening bell. We're kicking off another trading week here in this, the month of March. We're watching two of the newest members of the S&P 500 as well. We'll get to those in a second. Let's take a look at the Dow though first. Let's put this on a chart for you just as we kick off today's trading activity. I'll populate that. Why not a year to date view just to give you the setup that we've got coming into this, the midpoint of March. All right, taking a look at the Dow right now. Year to date up 3% today. Three tenths of a percent. NASDAQ composite, my goodness, rip your face off to start the day. It's up by about 1.2% here, 193 points to the upside there, 7.7% year to date. A little bit of chop there that we've seen in this month so far. So we'll see exactly where that nets out as we move forward. And the SP 500, you're seeing that up to start the day, green across the screen. Up by about uh, nine tenths of a percent, eight tenths of a percent. We'll round that off too. It's waffling in and out behind that midpoint anywhere. Anyway, eight percent higher year to date. Let's take a look at some of the heat maps here. We heard you like heat maps, so we loaded up some heat maps for you. Take a look at those NASDAQ 100 names. Microsoft is down by about half a percent to begin today's trading session, but in some good news areas, we've got Apple up by about 1.7% to begin today's trading activity. Google, Alphabet, Alpha Google, whatever you call them, call them higher by about 6% right now. Amazon, NVIDIA, Meta, also higher. NVIDIA is going to have their conference kicking off today as well. Our own Dan Halley is going to be reporting from there. Big week of earnings by market cap here. You've got Accenture, Pinduoduo, Nike, Micron, FedEx, Lululemon, General Mills all coming your way. We've got much of that. Plus, we're watching two of the newest members of the S&P 500 make their debut today. Super Microcomputer and Decker shares. They're on the move. And to break down the stocks for us, we've got Yahoo Finance reporter Madison Mills. Hey, Maddie. Hi, Brad. Thank you so much. So I want to start on Super Micro Computer, as you mentioned, because the shares of that company have gone up by 12-fold over the past year. This is a stock that is beating the likes of NVIDIA, which is only quadrupled, a measly performance in comparison with SMCI. Once this name gets added to the S&P 500 this morning, it will surely be the top performer for the past year by a mile compared with all other members of the S&P 500. So a huge deal for SMCI to be added here that's going to join the IT sector for the S&P. Now, just to give some background here, this is a name that began in the cloud growth era, focusing on servers uh, and the manufacturing side and delivery that is now fueling a lot of this AI rally. NVIDIA provides the chips. SMCI is the name that's going to be shipping them and sort of manufacturing the servers behind them. So interestingly, both of these companies starting in the exact same year, 1993, and both founders really kind of rely on having this kind of codependent relationship, for lack of a better word, on one another. Um, interesting to note, too, that half of SMCI's demand for their servers is driven by this AI boom. So this is a big AI play for those that are looking for it. Um, another name, though, guys, that's being added today, a little bit more of a fun one, I might say, is Deckers. They are another big success story when it comes to consumer discretionary. Uh, this is a shoe company here. This is the name that is behind the likes of Uggs, Hoka's. Uh, they are up 36% here year to date and really taking a lot of market share away from some of those other big players in the shoe space. When we think about a name like Nike, even a Foot Locker, those names really struggling over the past couple of months, particularly due to that lack of demand coming from consumers out of China. If you take a look at these stocks year to date, you can see that Deckers is really kind of the strong, clear outperformer compared with these other two names year to date here. Now, having said that, it's going to be interesting to see whether some other direct-to-consumer names in this space could be able to take market share away from Deckers. We saw that On On, uh, which is the company behind the On Cloud sneaker, was at the New York Stock Exchange on Friday as well. Are they going to kind of take away some of that market share from another direct-to-consumer sneaker brand? Uh, I'm not sure because I still see Uggs every second of every day here in NYU. They're back, Maddie. They're back. They're back. I'm one of the Ugg wearers again, although I, I never really stopped because they're just so comfortable. 
But you rock, <laughs> Maddie. Let's talk about the run up that we've seen in the prices of both of these stocks, right? Mm -hmm. Because we certainly have seen. You mentioned the year-to-date gains in both Super Microcomputer and also with Decker Outdoors. How much of this S and P inclusion has already been priced in from what you're reading from analysts? I mean, it seems like it has, yeah. surely. But we are still continuing to get upgrades on these names. Wedbush upgrading Decker's as recently as the 14th, so a couple of days ago here. Uh, still seeing some positive movement when it comes to the analyst notes on both of these stocks. And when you look at SMCI in particular, is there a ceiling for these AI plays is a question that I have. I was talking to someone last week who has an 8,000 price target on NVIDIA. I mean, when you have that kind of a price target, the head turn is, is correct there, Brad. It, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it, I mean, I don't know if we think that that's accurate, but it is a call, uh, so we talk about it. And if you think about a call that big for the NVIDIA names out there, that's going to have a read through to these other AI plays like an SMCI. Maddie, Isn't thanks it? for breaking these down yeah. for us. Man, I, I might need to get my feet in some Uggs, huh? You've never tried them? No. You're missing out, Brad. Brad? Yeah. Are you an Ugg wearer? I have the fake ones. I don't have any. Yeah. Fugs? But they're soft. Yeah, I mean, they're soft. It, it's they, good they, for the dog walk. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So maybe right. try that. Try All right. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to try the fake ones first, and then I'm going to matriculate to the real <laughs> ones there, get some real quality. <laughs> Thanks so much, Maddie. Appreciate it. Well, the semi's getting all the love on this Monday morning. Two price hikes to start the week, all stemming from the AI hype. Bank of America raising its price target on shares of Taiwan Semiconductor, calling the company a key enabler of AI with a long standing leadership. Now, similar vibes over at Morgan Stanley, the bank raising its price target on Micron, citing the market's clear desire to pay higher multiples for AI stories. Uh, let's take a look at both of the stock prices for these companies as well as we kind of dive in to what was behind the call there. Uh, and I'll begin here with uh, Taiwan Semi, if I will, because Bank of America boosting that price target, um, the new price target, $155 here U.S. They expect the structural advanced node demand here. And don't ask me what that means. I'm going to have to look into it just a little bit further here because I went to school for marketing and business law. But anyway, the structural advanced node demand to be stronger, supported by AI strength, computing power, and saving requirement as well. That's from the analyst Brad Lynn in this Monday note. Yeah, certainly. They're also very bullish on the partnership with Intel and what exactly that could look, look like here going forward. They talk about the fact that they see the upside here. The forecast is to increase their um, sales here from 3% to 6% in 2025, given the fact that at least this analyst from Bank of America does see upside from Intel outsourcing to Taiwan, the semiconductor. So that, of course, uh, being built into the expectation here from Bank of America, reflecting about a 14% upside move that they see for Taiwan Semiconductor from the stock's closing price on Friday. And then also flipping back over to Micron and what we're seeing there in the Morgan Stanley analyst. Now, this is an interesting call because at first, you might think that the company is actually a bit more bullish because they are raising their price targets. So yes, I guess in theory, but they all, you also got to keep in mind where the stock is trading today. So it's right above 95 bucks a share. The company's new price target is 78. They raised that up from 74, 75. So still below where the stock is trading today, below where it closed, obviously, on Friday. And the case that they are making here is that they are constructive on the opportunity that they do see for Micron ahead in this high bandwidth memory space. But in their view, it's more than priced into shares at the current level. So this is a stock year to date up just about 11 percent, but has been on a run. So they think at least it's fairly valued at this point, And that's why they're not raising their price target too much higher. Just for closure out there, for those that were wondering what structural node demand is here. <laughs> I mean, I guess you just have to boil it down to node and then you can add on the demand. But the node is essentially, as I understand it, just the network and the amount of protocol connections yeah. that are necessary for a network. That's the fact. Fast description here as we got to move on here. That's what they're telling me. What do you do? Here. Quick Google? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we got these laptops in we front do. of us. We got to do we'll something. Put them in more. Investors in focus this week. We've also got a big IPO coming to market. Reddit planning to make its public debut Thursday on the New York Stock Exchange. The company targeting a valuation around $6.4 billion. Shares estimated to cost between $31 and $34. And a new report says it's likely that Reddit will hit its target. Reuters reporting the IPO is between four and five times oversubscribed here for the latest entry of a, we're, we are calling this a social media company, right? Entering yeah. into the, the, I mean, it's it's pure blogging. It's not even micro blogging as Twitter used to call itself here. Um, but 
going to be interesting to see how this company does get the profitability. They noted that within their S1 as one of the risk factors they had to. Um, and then additionally, just the amount of daily qualified uniques that they see as well. I think that's their that's the new metric we got to get used to, the DAUQs. Yeah, daily qualified uniques. That was one of the uh, focal points here as we look ahead to their public debut coming up later this week. But, Brad, you just mentioned it there, and that's profitability, right? I think that is the big question going into what exactly the reception is going to be like surrounding Reddit. We have been waiting for Reddit to go public now for quite some time. The company, though, has lost money every single year since its launch in 2005. It lags some of their bigger bigger competitors out there when you, comp when you compare their numbers to a name like Meta, obviously, or even a name like X for Twitter. You could make the argument that they could be a bit more favorable given the current positioning here. But again, you're looking at the fact that sales numbers have improved. They're of 21% year over year to 804 million, but their net loss was almost 100 million there. So it is ha did improve from 2022 levels, but again, profitability, that is what many investors have been looking for. That has been the real change in terms of the IPO receptions over the last several months. Yeah. So we'll see whether or not Reddit is able to get more investors on board. Yeah, you talk about the time that we've been waiting, or at least the exchanges also have been waiting for this company to go public. I, I think I remember seeing pitch decks floating around when I was still working on the exchange side, you know, as early as 2017, 2018 mm -hmm. in some instances there. So uh, we'll continue to see how the investors receive this once it makes its public debut. Coming up, is the stock market a bubble? Uh, is, it, is the bubble at a risk of popping? That's the question. We're going to speak to a strategist. They got the answer next.
The S&P 500, as well as many of the major averages, really moving to the upside this year. The S&P up more than 7%, a lot of this rally, driven by just a handful of tech stocks, very similar to the story that we were talking about last year. So is the market nearing bubble territory, and how should you position yourself ahead of that? We want to bring in Paul Dietrich. He is the chief investment strategist with B. Riley Wealth. Paul, it's good to see you here, and you lay it out. Pretty straightforward in your most recent note, you say that people need to be aware of the fact that we are near the bubble territory. The stock market bubble is about to burst, is exactly how you put it. So we've been seeing this dramatic run up in stocks right now. When you say it's about to burst, what's that going to look like? What should investors be doing today? Well, I was managing money back uh, during the dot com uh, bubble. And um, I can tell you that the stock market can go up. You know, even though there are no fundamentals, uh, it's all momentum uh, for a long period of time. But when it does burst, it usually bursts quickly. And so that's uh, what we're looking at. I, I, I've analyzed the stock market from just about every traditional analysis that, that you can do to determine whether it's overvalued or undervalued. And... Uh, uh, every single indicator seems to tell us that we're in a historic, historic bubble. Uh, but how long it can go, uh, that's a good question, uh, because it certainly went on longer than I expected back uh, in 2000, 2001. And uh, you look at things like price earnings ratio. I mean, we haven't seen a gap between the, the PE for the S&P 500 and the price of the S&P 500 since uh, the internet bubble uh, back uh, in, in 2000. And, um, and then you look at something like the 200-day uh, the moving average, and there's a 13% gap, which is historic. Uh, that's what the that that's what the S and P 500 would have to go back to. Uh, it would have to drop 13% from right now uh, to get back to its 200-day uh, moving average. Uh, you look at other indicators, and they're all the same. There, there we're literally in historic territory, and. It's hard to look at that and say that uh, we're not going to see a major, major correction coming. Now is not the time to be putting new money into the market. Hmm. Paul, so when things feel bubbly like this, number one, what is the biggest indicator that you've looked at that sent off flashing lights and, and, and signals? And does that essentially initiate uh, a mindset for a lot of shorts to enter into this picture too? Well, I'm sure that every analyst and chartered financial analyst is looking at all the different valuation uh, uh, methodologies, and uh, and they've got to come to the same conclusion because there's just no ambiguity here. Uh, it, it is bizarrely overvalued in most of these things. And so you're seeing the smart money right now uh, moving massive amounts into cash. I mean, we saw Jeff Bezos sell $8 billion worth of Amazon. Uh, uh, Zuckerberg last week sold a billion dollars of, of Meta. Uh, it's not that they don't believe in their companies. They do. They're just, they know that it's just completely overvalued. And if they sell it now, uh, they can buy it back cheaper later. And uh, so uh, the Walmart family just sold, I believe, 4.5 billion uh, in Walmart stock. Warren Buffett has sold his stocks of the companies that he doesn't wholly own, a lot of them, and he's created a $158 billion um, um, uh, cash hoard so that he can use that. So uh, we're also looking at corporate cash, and it, it's historically at its highest level ever. So this is why, you know, you ought to, maybe they know something that we don't know uh, as average people. Yeah, and, but then there's also the flip side that a lot of people are really questioning whether or not that even signals the end of this rally that we have seen. Paul, I want to ask you, though, in terms of what is going to trigger this correction that you are expecting, what is that one event that you think is going to cause this massive reversal? 
That's a really good question. And uh, because most of the triggers, if you look back at previous recessions, were not really anticipated. Um, you know, not many people saw Lehman Brothers collapsing uh, and uh, in the 2008, 2009. Uh, we didn't see the the points that uh, that brought the internet bubble to, uh, you know, where it dropped. You've got to remember the S&P dropped 49% peak to bottom uh, after the internet bubble. And, um, so I, I think that it could be uh, a geopolitical uh, issue. Uh, certainly, if oil prices go up or if, if oil were, you know, stopped being shipped through the Straits of Hormuz because of the Houthi rebels, that would increase inflation. Hmm. The Fed would be forced to raise rates. That could be a trigger. I think another trigger that's quite possible is um, is basically the refinancing of commercial real estate. There's like trillions coming up in the next 18 months that need to be refinanced. 70% of it's done by regional banks. And if you look at regional banks, they're not as well capitalized as the too big to fail uh, banks. And all you need is, uh, you know, a couple of them just not you know, not having the capital uh, if there's a run on the banks uh, because of the uh, uh, some of the problems they're having with the real estate that they 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 have financed and uh, can't be refinanced. So th these are possible things. I see this uh, if we do have a recession. I see it as a very mild recession, hmm. uh, very similar to to the dot com recession in two thousand one and two. Huh. People forget that, that was a very mild recession. We had two quarters of negative GDP growth, right. where we never even went down one percent. Uh, but the, the thing that people don't understand is that the stock market can really go down in a mild recession uh, because because of the dot com bubble was so big. Yeah. Uh, and it ran up so high. Um, basically, you saw a 49 percent drop. Well, uh, in the S&P 500. Well, yeah, Paul, I mean, we're, we're I got my praying hands emoji ready that we don't see some of those exogenous events here. We're going to be tracking it extremely closely, as we know you will as well. And any of the market implications, Paul Dietrich, who is the B. Riley Wealth Chief Investment Strategist. Paul, thanks for taking the time this morning. Coming up, everyone, what you need to know about the controversial Don Lemon, Elon Musk interview. That is after this break.
be uh, a collaboration between SpaceX and Tesla. So, you know, you can expect some rockety stuff there. Um, a flying car? Maybe. <laughs> it's not out of the question. It's going to have some rocket technology in it. Um, I think the, really the only way to do something that's cooler than the Cybertruck is, is to combine uh, SpaceX and, and, and Tesla technology to create something that's not even really a car. Then what would it be? Something that's never existed before. I'm getting Jetsons vibes. Totally Jetsons vibes. All right, so that's a totally new class of transportation, perhaps. Elon Musk teasing details about a possible flying car in the works at Tesla in combination with SpaceX, his other company, in a new interview with former CNN anchor Don Lemon. Musk telling Lemon a new model of the Roadster will be a collaboration between Tesla and SpaceX, and we can expect, quote, some rocket stuff there. The interview went up this morning on Don Lemon's personal page after Musk revealed he will not proceed with a content partnership with Lemon that included posting three 30-minute episodes a week led by the journalist here. Also noteworthy because the Roadster is such a small percent of the potential sales for Tesla. He also made comments about the Cybertruck, talking about one million reservations. Also said that this might be the most influential vehicle that we see in a 10-year time span. And so ultimately that tells you exactly how much they're going to continue to lean into this Cybertruck. And it's right to do so. It's just a matter of at what pricing, too, because that's going to be critical for a market where we've already seen Ford lead in pickup trucks for decades at this point. So the truck space is right for Tesla to get into, just at a matter of what pricing and if they can deliver upon some of the lofty expectations they put out there. Yeah, exactly. And he also went on to say he called it the best product that they have, a special product, like you said, only comes out once a decade. There have been so much interest in the Cybertruck, exactly the orders that you just mentioned, a million orders there for the Cybertruck, what exactly that translates into actual purchases and then also beyond the initial excitement because so many people have been waiting so long on the Cybertruck, whether or not sales hold up and are also right. able to build then in the coming years, that's a huge question for investors. And then the Roadster, nothing too different than what he has said over the last several weeks, but he does an excellent job in selling and getting people very excited for the new products. Case in point, when it comes to Cybertruck, by the time it actually debuted, so many people have been talking about it, it felt like forever. Now there has been focus on the road server, which we are expected to get a look at later this year. So not ruling out a flying, a flying car, comparing it to the Jetsons. I mean, I think that is exactly what people wanted to hear. Yeah. Whether or not that actually happens is a whole nother conversation. Yeah, propulsion and a frunk. That's exactly <laughs> what you want. All right, well, let's also take a look because shares of Tesla are moving to the upside. Another big uh, data point out this morning, or a headline, I should say. The company raising the price on its Model Y by $1,000 next month in April. You're now looking at gains of just about 2%. We know Tesla had been slashing its prices in order to boost demand. It was a concern here amongst analysts over the last several quarters. Evercore coming out saying that the price rise is, quote, likely a marketing push to sell production inventory into quarter end as Q1 deliveries appear weak. But again, Tesla raising the price here by a thousand bucks, maybe will help their margins. How long, though, the key price is there? That, of course, is a question, too. Well, and how the rest of the industry responds as yeah. well. Any time you see a price movement in Tesla, more often than not, GM, Ford, also Stellantis, considering how they can make sure that their pricing mechanisms keep pace with the demand environment, too. All right, we'll keep it right here on Yahoo Finance. We've got much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back.
Good Monday morning, everyone. I'm Brad Smith alongside Sean Smith. We're 30 minutes into the trading session. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. Markets are higher as investors await the latest policy decision from the Federal Reserve. That's Wednesday. All eyes will be on that dot plot to get a sense of the rate cuts to come this year. Now to some trending tickers that we're tracking here this morning. Goldman Sachs trimmed its price target on Tesla from $220 a share to $190 a share. The company faces a slew of production market headwinds and analyst Mark Delaney saying that Tesla is well positioned for longer term growth, but softer near term EV market conditions are seen weighing on earnings. Shares still higher today right now by about 2.4 percent. Meanwhile, Morgan Stanley says it's time to buy shares of Pepsi. Analyst Dara Maznian saying that they're upgrading the beverage and snack giants to overweight from equal weight, calling it a top pick. The new price target of $190 indicates a 15.4% upside over the next 12 months. And finally, shares of San Francisco-based software provider HashCorp are rallying today following a report from Bloomberg citing that the company has been exploring options that include a sale. HashCorp's software helps companies in a range of industries set up their digital infrastructure in the cloud. No details of the sale have been reported yet, according to Bloomberg. Shares of HashCorp up 8% right now. All right, we wanted to get to some breaking news. Home builder confidence rising once again in March, hitting 51. That was compared to the 48 reading that we got the prior month here. But 51, that's passing the break even point. The first time that we have seen a break above 50 since July. It's the highest reading that we've seen since July of 2023. Also marks the fourth month in a row that we have seen a gain for the index. So why are home builders feeling a bit better about the landscape right now? A couple of things are going into it. One, the lack of inventory of existing existing homes. That is a factor that we have been talking about now for quite some time. So it's driving those would-be buyers to new home construction, almost the only game in town at this point. Also, the fact that we've seen mortgage rates pull back just a bit from the peak levels that we saw in the fall. That's helping in builder sentiment, at least at this point here. So again, Brad, we talk about the current landscape right now. For the real estate sector, the fact that existing homes, still inventory levels, yes, they have improved just a bit, but they are well below what we typically see when you compare it to historic norms. Home builders then picking up some of that slack as best as they can. And because of that, we've seen a boost here in their confidence ratings. What is a conversation without homes without what the Fed is doing here? And we've got that from the chief economist Robert Dietz over at the NAHB saying with the Federal Reserve expected to announce future rate cuts in the second half of 2024, lower finance costs will draw many prospective buyers into the market. Goes on to say, however, as home building activity builds up and picks up, builders will likely grapple with rising material prices, particularly, once again, and stop me if you've heard this before, for lumber. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be one important commodity to continue to watch going towards the back half of this year as well. From the latest read from the National Association of Home Builders showing that the sector continuing to recover, which companies are best positioned in this environment? We're now joined by Rafe Jadrasich, who is the B of A Securities Senior Home Builders Analyst. First, just wanted to get your takeaway from this latest reading as builder sentiment rises above that break-even point. Great. Th thanks for having me. Yeah, so what we've seen so far this year is that going into spring selling, new home demand has stayed relatively robust, despite that, as you mentioned, mortgage rates have stabilized, but they are still elevated. Home builders have been able to sell homes by first using rate buy downs, um, which is helping to, to drive demand. Um, but also they've been building some smaller homes that help solve the affordability buyers, uh, the affordability challenges for buyers. So generally a pretty strong start to the year going into spring selling for, for home builders. Is that a trend that you expect to continue, Rafe? Yeah, so we have a pr proprietary indicator for new home sales. Um, and generally, it's showing that that we'd expect a recovery through uh, through 2024, um, despite, again, the higher rates. Where we're seeing tailwinds, we still have really strong demographics, and that's millennials entering the, the home market. Uh, boomers are actually still the, the biggest buyer of, of homes, and they've been benefiting from a wealth effect. Um, and then you're, you're also ge generally seeing just just favorable job market and, and um, a strong economy. Um, so all that is, is helping offset the, the higher rates and tight affordability. Right, when we talk about the fact that new homes uh, accounting for more of the overall homes uh, sold here, are, are you expecting that to happen again? And I guess, what is that percentage that you're expecting to see of new homes accounting for overall home sales? So if you look at active listings in the U.S., historically, uh, it's about new homes are about 10 to 15% of the total active listings. 
Right now, that's up to 30% of the active listings on the market that are new home. And that, that goes back to a point that you made earlier. Um, there's just very homes, a few uh, homes that are in the resale market that are being listed. Um, and that's what we expect that to sort of continue in a, in a similar pace. Right now, 80% of, of people that have a mortgage on their house um, are below 5%, which is well below the six, uh, six and three quarter rate that's out there right now. So the disincentive for people to sell their house is very high. Um, so we would expect the, 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 the majority of listings to, or at least in the 30% range of listings to remain in the new home side. If we see less rate cuts from the Fed than anticipated on the back half of this year, how will that impact some of the buyer activity that you're anticipating to emerge? I, it's, it's, what's really interesting, what we've learned, um, is that even just mortgage rate stability has brought back buyers into the market. Hmm. Um, so even without seeing mortgage rates come down, we've seen pretty robust demand heading into spring. Um, and just stability on the mortgage rate side has given people confidence to come back into the market. So you don't think, I guess, talk a little bit more specifically about what you expect mortgage rates that level to be at where we are today compared to where we will likely be then at the end of the year if the Fed does in fact cut? Because I think a lot of people are asking how quickly the rate on the 30-year mortgage will go down if we do see the Fed cut. So there's, there's two factors driving the mortgage rate, right? Mm -hmm. You have the 10-year Treasury yield, which is it's, it's partially set off of, um, and then you have the spread of, 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 of the mortgage rate above that. Um, mortgage rate volatility is a big driver of that spread. Um, and what we've seen is that that mortgage rate vol has started to come down and compress a little bit. So as mortgage rate volatility comes down, you know, right now the spread is almost 300 basis points. Mortgage rates are nearly 300 basis points above the 10-year Treasury yield. Uh, we would actually expect that to start to narrow. Um, generally, we, our, our mortgage-backed security team expects mortgage rates to kind of settle in the low 6% range, about six and a quarter. Um, and that's with the 10-year, it's with two uh, 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 Fed rate cuts this year. And then just lastly, while we have you, at, at what price? Are, are we anticipating a material delta in how the average price shifts as, as we kind of move into the buying season this year versus what we saw last year? Hey, the interesting dynamic that's happening in the housing market is new home prices have come down about 10% from the peak levels, while existing home prices haven't come down at all. Hmm. Um, we think new home prices have generally stabilized at these levels with mortgage rate, rate stable. Um, overall, we expect kind of a, a low single digit increase in home prices in, in 2024. And generally, that's just driven by the stabilization or even uh, decline in mortgage rates later on in this, this year. All right, Rafe Jadrasich, Bank of America's Securities, a senior home builders analyst. Thanks so much for joining us here, Rafe. Great. Thanks for having me. We want to stick with the latest in the housing market and a massive change coming to home buying and selling, and that has sent shares of Zillow and Redfin into the red once again today. You're looking at Redfin and Zillow both off nearly 4% on the back of the sell-off that we saw in Friday's afternoon trading. Now, the National Association of Realtors is settling several long-running lawsuits over the way that real estate brokers are paid following the sell settlement. So realtors could start selling, seeing dramatically lower commission fees. They currently get around 5 to 6% on most homes sold. But the real change here is on the buyer side of it, right, Brad? Because it really has to do with the buyer's agent and how that rate is set. So the thought process here is that if you're out there buying a home, there will be more transparency and there will be room for negotiation on what exactly that rate is going to be and whether or not it even makes sense to have a buying agent in some uh, in some situations. But again, is this really going to change anything in the long run and how materially you would think it would really be for first time home buyers? Mm -hmm. But again, the the reason why we are talking about this uh, settlement is because the impact it's going to have on names like Zillow and Redfin, those companies, and exactly what it means for consumers here potentially saving money in the home buying process. Right, and for Redfin, what they've been trying to do is offer incentives to potential buyers to say that if you go on a second tour and if uh, you're able to sign up to work with a Redfin agent before that second tour, that you get this type of discount on those fees that you would see, uh, or you know, a, a percentage, half a percentage, roughly 
roughly is at the top end of the range um, on a discount or a refund of the purchase price at closing there. So that's the way that they've been trying to make it more sticky to go through that process with an agent. But this, again, a, a huge settlement, and we'll see how investors kind of trade on this potential impact for both Zillow and Redfin, as you yeah, mentioned. Again, under pressure once again today. All right, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more coming up. First up, we've got Apple reportedly in talks with Google to incorporate its AI model Gemini into the latest iPhones, what that means for both of these stocks and for you. Next. Apple is reportedly in talks with Google to use its generative AI engine Gemini on its iPhones. This is according to a report from Bloomberg. Now, this comes after Apple also reportedly held conversations with OpenAI to use its product. For more on what this could mean for the tech giants and the broader industry, we want to bring in Martin Yang. He's Oppenheimer's senior analyst of emerging technologies and services. Martin, it's good to see you. So just first, your reaction to this report, and if it's true, how big of a deal this is for Apple? Well, this is a very big deal for Apple because it removes uh, the near-term concern that Apple cannot implement uh, any Gen AI functions on iPhone due to its lack of infrastructure investments relative to other uh, large tech companies. And then uh, I think it positions iPhone, uh, at least in the near term, uh, to be the go-to device to uh, interact with large language models. And so additionally, Martin, when you think about the fact that Google Alphabet is going to pick up a potential win on this as well, I mean, what is it going to take for this to be successful as both of these companies would want it to be? 
I think it will require a lot of nuance on how uh, the large language models or Gen AI functions will be implemented because uh, it can uh, augment search capabilities, but there are also a large number of uh, applications they can use. Uh, one example will be uh, a similar implementation to uh, co-pilot for the, uh, uh, the productivity functions, uh, productivity applications uh, from Apple, um, similar to Microsoft implementation of co-pilot for its Office Suite. Ron, what does it tell us though about Apple's internal efforts? Because there has been some optimism, some chatter, especially over the last couple of weeks, just about what they are doing and how much they are investing in their own AI efforts. Is that maybe not as far as some had anticipated it was up until this point? Right. Uh, we believe that there's a catch up Apple needs to do uh, to build up its own infrastructure to train uh, large language models uh, because the short supply of uh, GPU cards from NVIDIA. And in, in, in the, maybe in the new, more near term, I think there is a way for Apple to implement on-device AIs uh, using Apple Silicon, but those are uh, not the equivalent of uh, OpenAI's GP, uh, GPT-4 or Gemini in the near term. Martin, you think about what generative AI could be for the next super cycle for iPhones and, and for Apple specifically. What type of material difference are you expecting as consumers try to get their hands on the latest cutting edge technology there? Sure, I think there are a couple of ways for us to get excited about the next generation iPhone with more capable AI functions. Uh, number one, it will be, you know, Siri becomes real, uh, really helpful to the users. Right now it's really handicapped um, and by, you know, uh, Siri right now is referring to, you know, telling us about weather, telling us about the time, setting timers. Um, and I think the next iteration of Siri, augmented by AI, could be becomes really helpful as an agent, will help us navigate through multiple apps and then getting us uh, real bookings for hotels, reservations, and restaurants, and then, you know, getting us, you know, uh, getting us really real world applications of things we could do with iPhones, um, you know, um, where the interface becomes voice and as opposed to touch and um, other controls. Martin, do you see this partnership drawing the attention of regulators? And I bring this up because the current partnership that Google and Apple have on search has already drawn a lawsuit from the Department of Justice. I don't think so in the near term because I think I don't think there's a, a very strong regulatory framework around Gen AI. Um, so how do you define Gen AI market? Is this going to uh, is this alliance going to dominate uh, the Gen AI market for consumers? I don't think there's any clear understanding of the market size and growth of the market just yet. It sounds like not only were they in talks with Google, but they also may have at some point been in talks with. OpenAI, what would be the material difference that we might see if it was Google's Gemini versus OpenAI? I think it's too early to um, tell um, from, from my perspective. Um, I think I think the uh, maybe a higher priority discussion, uh, higher priority items in those negotiations is you know commercial agreements. You know how much Apple or Google should pay uh, to win this slot. Um, I don't think the, the AI functions is um, is the determinant factor at the moment uh, because the consumer applications on device uh, for iPhone uh, is not going to be the same as the, all those online interfaces. Martin, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Really appreciate it. Oppenheimer, Senior Analyst of Emerging Technologies and Services. Martin Yang, we appreciate it as always. Thank you, my pleasure. Certainly. And coming up, we're heading live to Houston, Texas to check in with Julie Hyman at Sarah Week. Oh man, I wonder if Michael Sarah's there. Anyway, you don't want to miss that.
Sarah Week by S&P Global kicks off in Houston, Texas today. The annual Global Energy Conference bringing together all the top names in oil and natural gas. Yahoo Finance's market domination anchor Julie Hyman is live on the ground to give us some top themes that she's watching. Hey, Julie. Hey there, Brad. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's an interesting conference because of the volume of executives from around the globe in the oil and gas industry that converge here in Houston every year to meet um, both on stage and on the sidelines to talk about some of the big issues facing the industry. Now, what we've had a lot of as of late has been M&A activity in oil and gas now, and that's on sort of all levels, both upstream, that is exploration and production, midstream, the pipelines, and downstream, that's refining uh, and making other types of products from oil. So we've had a lot of blockbuster deals in the past year. We'll be looking to see if a lot of them get regulatory approval. Many of them will make the largest oil companies larger. For example, Exxon, $60 billion acquisition of Pioneer, Chevron's acquisition of Hess, which is facing some resistance from Exxon, um, as well as Occidental's acquisition of Crown Rock. So there's a lot going on in that area. So that's thing one. Thing two, energy transition. And that's what the executives here want to talk about, even though energy transition is not currently a large part of these companies' businesses at all. They are looking to a future where we will see continued wind down of uh, oil and gas. What's interesting about that is there's recently been a tone shift in the industry spearheaded by Exxon CEO Darren Woods that we are not ready to give up our reliance on fossil fuels anytime soon. Uh, he's sort of striking uh, what he would portray as sort of a more realistic tone. All of that said, all of these companies are developing mostly carbon capture technologies, either taking uh, carbon dioxide from the air or from the processes that they're using to extract oil and gas from the ground and basically burying it so that it doesn't go into the atmosphere. And then thing three, AI, of course, because AI is infusing everything right now. Even as we see NVIDIA's GTC conference go on, it will be a topic of conversation here at Sarah Week as well. How is the industry using AI to, for example, better monitor um, how much oil and gas are getting out of the ground, monitoring their emissions, et cetera? So that's going to be an interesting conversation. We had the backdrop for all of this just quickly. Oil prices have been rising. You know, energy stocks have been sort of out of favor because of the AI trade. But with oil up about 15% or so year to date and continuing its rally, some of the attention, guys, is coming back to the industry. There's a lot of attention on the industry right now. Julie, you have a number of big interviews lined up for Yahoo Finance. What can we expect? We do, and I'm really excited about this. So we're going to be hearing from Vicki Holub, the CEO of Occidental Petroleum. As I mentioned, uh, they're in the process of acquiring Crown Rock, um, as well as developing direct air capture. That is trying to pull carbon dioxide out of the air and sequestering it underground, burying it underground. So that's an interesting topic of conversation for her. Of course, Occidental also has the support of Warren Buffett, remember. So we'll be talking about that as well. We'll hear from Darren Woods. I mentioned him a couple times the CEO of ExxonMobil about what his company is doing on that front. And then Doug Peterson, the host of the conference here, S&P Global CEO, he has been very active on transparency, on monitoring of ESG metrics. That is a subject very much in focus right now because the Securities and Exchange Commission just passed rules to try to increase reporting on the part of companies, but that's something that is facing a lot of resistance. So we'll have plenty to talk to him about as well, you guys. Certainly do. All right, Julie, we look forward to those conversations. Thanks so much. Well, oil prices, like Julie was just saying, are climbing once again today. You've got Brent briefly surpassing 86 bucks for the first time that we've seen that level since November. And you also have crude surpassing 80, just above 81 bucks a barrel. Prices for Brent and crude swinging to the upside over the last week. This comes as Ukraine steps up its attacks on Russian energy infrastructure. We have seen this steady march higher, though, for quite some time. So we want to bring in Tom Fitzpatrick. He is RJ O'Brien's Global Market Insights managing a director. RJ, it's great to have you here. So we've seen this march to the upside ahead of Sarah Week. There is certainly a lot of focus on energy, on transition, on M&A, a number of the top themes that our colleague Julie Hyman was just talking about playing out within the energy space. Talk to us just about this move higher that we've seen in prices and what that tells us about what's likely to come within the space. 
Thanks very much, and thanks for having me. Um, you know, I think in terms of this move higher, one of the things we should always remember is that you know, oil is an industrial commodity, but it's also to a certain extent a financial asset. Uh, and how it trades is not always a function totally of the supply and demand dynamics out in the economy. The classic example of that being 2007, 2008, when the oil price tripled in price, but you certainly couldn't validate that there was a demand backdrop which actually created that. So, so this move certainly initially is very technical. Uh, we completed a bullish outside week on oil last week. And in fact, on WTI, that's the second one in the last three weeks. But outside of that, you haven't seen this development since April of 2022. And when we got that in April 2022, Oil ended up going significantly higher in the following eight weeks. And we also posted this bullish outside week and Brent crude last week, um, which is the first one that we've actually seen on that since April 2022. So big technical developments in breaking out of the three-month trading range and the weekly reversals suggest that we can continue to push higher. We have some good levels around 83.50 on WTI and 89 on Brent. But if we get through those levels, then there could be a real danger that we could be pushing even further to the top side towards 95 to 97. And mm. I think what's going to be very important is, is figuring out the ultimate reasonings for this, because the feedback loop, depending on that, can be very different. Yeah, Tom, I mean, we think back to April 2022 and, and remember what was happening that also influenced some of the price action there. It was geopolitical conflict. It was Russia, Ukraine. Are we just one exogenous event away from seeing another massive spike in oil? Uh, it's a valid point, Brad. I mean, who knows what tail risks are out there, but sometimes price action tells you what we are susceptible to. Uh, and if there was a new event, that would certainly suggest that given the way price action is already trading, that the up move could accelerate to the top side. But you know, without outside those events, I, I think we'd have to look at this and say that this doesn't necessarily indicate we'd see a move of that magnitude. Um, and this doesn't come off the low of the trend either. So it's not as an aggressive reversal as we would have seen then when oil was already moving down, hmm. whereas we've already moved up about 20%. So it is, it is important if we do get another event, but I would suggest that this dynamic that we're seeing at the moment is, is very much absent that event. And while it's been a good push of about 20% since December, it doesn't yet rise to the significance of what we saw back in 2022. Tom, when we take a look at a lot of the M&A activity in the fourth quarter of 2023, record $144 billion worth of deals were signed for energy producers. That was according to the latest out of here from Inverus. What does that tell us just about the setup then for 2024 and whether or not we could expect a further uptick in deals within the space? I mean, at the end of the day, at a minimum, what it tells you is that fossil fuels are not dead. Um, you know, the transition in terms of fossil fuels to alternative forms of energy, you know, has certainly been a main focus. But that takes time. That takes investment. Uh, and in a global economy where a lot of countries are all very, already very stretched in terms of their fiscal position, you're already seeing a scenario where, you know, that may take a transition period longer than people had previously thought. Um, so as a consequence, you're sitting at an oil price that's back to where it was a year ago. You're sitting at an oil price that, from an historic perspective, no, it's not at the 2008 highs or not even at the highs we saw after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But at 80, 85, 90, 95 dollars, it's certainly at very elevated levels compared to what we've seen on a multitude of occasions in the last 10 to 15 years. Uh, and as I guess, as a backdrop, when people look at that, they look at the geopolitical tensions that Brad has talked about. They look at the underlying dynamic of the overall economy where we're probably producing, you know, as much as we can potentially produce. And they see where the oil price is. That feedback loop probably suggests to them that seems to be a very resilient commodity and therefore an area on that basis that's probably you know, worth continuing to look at from an investment perspective. To what extent do you expect what we're monitoring within the oil market and, and Brent crude, even at for the assets in review over at BlackRock, at the top end of their 2024 range at this juncture, uh, to what extent does this all kind of pass into the Fed and what they're going to be discussing this weekend and moving forward? I think that's a hugely interesting topic because, you know, often people look at the oil price and they think oil price up, 
that's interest rates up, oil price down, interest rates down, inflation, disinflation. What's much more important, and I think particularly for policymakers, is to identify why the oil price is doing what it's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go back to 2022 when the oil prices surged, let's not forget that oil prices were surging at the same time as we had the biggest fiscal and monetary stimulus in the history of mankind, at the same time when employment was pitch picking up quite dramatically and the savings rate was growing exponentially due to that fiscal stimulus. So the economy was recovering, the amount of money and free money in the economy was abundant, and therefore a rising oil price was not really a drag. But fast forward today, if you do not believe that this oil price move is a function of some significant pickup in economic activity, and I would suggest looking at China, Japan, Europe, at or on the borders of recession, US real growth high, but nominal growth falling, it doesn't look like a very demand-driven move. And therefore, it's no different from a tax hike. And you would not raise interest rates or you would not get more aggressive in terms of your monetary policy if prices were pushing higher because of a tax hike. So sure, it has a danger of showing up in headline inflation. But with unemployment rising, with the savings rate lower, with salary increases moderating, when it feels like a lot of people tapped out, this is far more likely to result in a substitution effect. We already see very weak retail sales coming through and an underlying drag on the economy. So we've seen the ECB plenty of times in the past make the mistake of reacting to dynamics that were only due to a non-demand driven move in the oil price. Mm -hmm. I don't think we will see the Fed do that. I think they will be looking through that dynamic because if anything, this has the potential to be disinflationary at the core if it means that spending, which is not really discretionary um, in terms of oil, takes away from the ability for people to spend and at a time when mortgage rates are close to 7% and interest rates are much higher. Right. So I think the Fed needs to be prepared to look back from this and, and not be looking at this as something they should be reacting to at this point. Tom, really great insights and analysis. Thanks so much for taking the time to have the conversation with us today. Tom Fitzpatrick, RJ O'Brien, Global Market Insights Managing Director. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Certainly. Shares of United Airlines, they are ticking lower today. As CEO Scott Kirby announces, the company is launching a safety review of the airline as they have faced multiple issues in the span of just a few days, including a Boeing plane that landed without one of its fuselage panels at an Oregon airport on Friday. The FAA is also investigating nine incidents this month involving United planes here. Uh, and so all of this considered, I, I think it actually places more focus on just how long now some of the aircrafts are going to remain in circulation as you're seeing a push out of delivery of some of the aircrafts that were expected. Ed Bastian in the previous earnings period as well had given me some insight into that. Typically when you have to overhaul an engine or overhaul a plane, it takes about a 30 to 40 day period and you have to do it every four or five years. There's gonna be more pressure on more of those planes to remain in circulation for a little bit longer of a period of time as they now take delivery of some of the new Airbus, the new Boeings that many of these airlines have uh, really signed on for these delivery orders. Yeah, and I think this also just highlights the backlash, right, that we've been talking about with a number of yeah. these commercial airlines because of what has happened with Boeing over the last several weeks, several months. These, these commercial uh, airlines are now feeling the pressure. And because of that, you have the fact that CEO Scott Kirby feels the need to address and uh, launch an investigation here into exactly what is happening, the safety of their planes. That he's trying to do his best to appeal to some of the customers. You mentioned the incident that happened at the end of last week. That was yeah. just one of a long list. They also had a United plane that lost a tire shortly after departure. One of their engines caught fire, for, uh, forcing an emergency landing. That was another situation. You had another United plane run off a taxiway in Houston. So there's a long list of incidents that have happened. Of the nine that you mentioned there, Brad, six of those incidents involve a Boeing plane. So uh, the United CEO, Scott Kirby, coming out saying that they are launching a safety review here for the company. And they're looking to reassure people who may be a bit skeptical or yeah. unsure about getting on airlines right now, specifically United, because of the events that have happened over the last several weeks. Absolutely. We'll see what comes of that internal review and bring you the latest discoveries there. Coming up, though, we're going to speak with Elvis CEO. Sally Krawcheck on what Wednesday's Fed decision means for your portfolio. That's next.
The Fed's March meeting is beginning tomorrow. We will get the decision on Wednesday. Investors anticipating what we are going to hear from Fed Chair Jerome Powell and what he's going to say about the economy, given the resilient econ data that we have gotten out over the last several weeks. We want to bring Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer, who's been closely following that and more. So, Josh. Lay it all out for us. Yeah, I would say perhaps the biggest risk to the markets this week, or maybe catalyst, if you will, to the markets over the next couple of days, could be essentially this dot plot showing that the Fed might cut less this year. One of the key risks that some economists are flagging just overall would be it takes just two Fed officials to move their projection for us to go from a median projection of three cuts this year to a median projection of two cuts. This, given how we know the expectation for Fed rate cuts has moved markets in the past. Remember the rally we saw in December when we expected more cuts? It could be considered an overall risk to stocks here. We're sitting still close to record levels. We haven't had a 2% sell-off in over four months now. So people have sort of, it feels like some people might be waiting for a reason to sell. We've been talking a lot about that over the past couple of weeks, and it just hasn't come. Maybe the dot plot could be this. But I will say, guys, I've been talking to some strategists about this, and there are some people that say maybe we don't see a sell-off off just one Fed rate cut getting taken off the table, and maybe overall the story doesn't change that much when you zoom out. You have a lot of the chief investment officers that have been taking note, at least, of the amount of positions that are moving into cash. Does this kind of move that dial one way or another if we see the Fed come out and say something that the markets disagree heavily with? Yeah, Brad, it'd be interesting because you'd think moving into cash would make sense when you're going to expect rates to be higher for longer, right? So maybe you continue to see that theme, which would be against some of the bull theses that we see out there. With There's a lot of people sitting in cash. At some point, they're going to want to allocate. Right. Well, maybe not if the Fed doesn't cut it all this year, right? Maybe you just stay at your 5% rate and sort of play it safe. But I think another interesting dynamic that was explained to me over from the team at Bank of America, just in terms of if the Fed doesn't cut, B of A said that that doesn't really change their 5,400 call on the S&P 500, which I found pretty interesting. And they sort of pointed out that if the Fed doesn't cut, or even if we see this dot plot move to two cuts, that likely comes with an upgrade to the GDP forecast, right? We know the economy doing well is obviously good for companies. So at a high level, we can understand how that might be good. And then overall, just at this point, we're talking about 50 basis point cut, 75% basis point cut. Some people are just saying when you think about the overall cap structure of these large companies, it's not going to matter that much. And the additional stat that Bank of America likes to point out, which is quite interesting, 75% of the S&P 500 is currently in long-term fixed debt. That would mean they're not coming back to market to refinance at these high levels. So even if interest rates are still high, the companies aren't going to see it the same way the companies, a lot of companies haven't fully seen it yet. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're still in a good position and it doesn't really change that earnings story because the economy is going to do well. So maybe even if we get a sell off on this dot plot, maybe it's not fully time to panic on the year. Yeah, exactly. And that also just goes to the fact that this narrative that we've been talking about now, this whole debate about whether or not the market's being a bit too optimistic mm -hmm. about the rate cuts that they are expecting three before year end. It doesn't really matter in the grand right. scheme of things. And that has been largely the story that we are hearing more and more from strategists and even yeah. economists, right? In terms of the longer term story and what we are going to be talking about six months, 12 months from now is not so much hinging on these three rate cuts between now and the end of the day. It's just the whole calculus, I think, has started to change in terms of what exactly that means, the overall impact, and whether or not it's going to have a material impact in the performance more broadly. We speaking. went from six rate cuts priced in and the market rallying on that. I was, and we're still to, all time. Nice. Three. Mm -hmm. And stocks kept rallying through that. A lot of people were talking about, it seems like in the last week, getting worried about these rate cut expectations, worried about these rate cut expectations. We just slashed them in half for a month and a half and hit mm -hmm. new highs in every index. Yeah. And the market hears what it wants to hear. And it's the, the pacing or the timeline of those rate cuts yeah. actually coming to fruition, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it seems like for the analysts or the economists out there, they, they put that on themselves. They have their own year-end goals, too, mm -hmm. <laughs> that they have to report Excited back Excited for the they July debate. We right. got, they they got the July debate is going to start after this yeah. meeting. It'll be fun. Well, can't wait. Yeah, get your flip-flops ready. Josh, <laughs> thanks so much for taking the time. Appreciate it. All right, guys, switching gears here. Investors shifting focus this week to the Fed decision. That is on tap to come Wednesday after their two-day meeting concludes. So what does this mean for your portfolio? Investment and wealth management company Elvis recently crossed $2 billion in client assets under management. That AUM and CEO Sally Krawcheck joins us now. Great to have you here with us. So Going into this critical Fed decision to perhaps set up what the tenor may be for the rest of the year, 
What most notably would you be listening for and, and advising other investors out there to pay closest attention to? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, and at Elevest, we we are not traders. Uh, we don't tend to look at the short term moves um, and construct portfolios off of that. We tend to look towards what the longer term returns of the equity markets, the bond markets, et cetera, um, are projected to be and have been. Um, and advise clients to let us set that in that uh, asset allocation for them. Let us rebalance for them when it makes sense. And in particular, uh, make sure to have, if you can, a recurring deposit into your investment account so that as the market tends to be very dramatic, very focused on short term things, can show volatility, our clients will be um, investing in the market in good times and tougher times and averaging out to uh, returns that historically have been pretty terrific. I'm curious, Sally, just given the fact that we are at record highs, given the fact that we have had so much talk about AI and what exactly that is going to do in terms of changing that long-term dynamic, not only for the market, but obviously for the economy as well, how has that conversation then changed amongst your clients and what you are hearing from them in terms of what they want to see and, and how they want to be positioned at this point? Yeah. Um, you know, there there is a lot of curiosity around AI and the opportunity um, to transform the economy and to get the returns from it, but also recognizing that a lot of these big waves um, have made people a lot of money and have lost people a lot of money. You could have perfectly foreseen, you know, the railroad, the the um, you know the railroad uh, being built across this country and lost a lot of money by investing in the wrong companies. You could have perfectly foreseen, you know, the automobile industry uh, becoming so strong and lost a lot of money doing it. Crypto, you could have lost a lot of money there. And so that's why diversification is important. Uh, getting access to investing in places that are are hot, but also, you know, those contrarian investments as well. And having the balance of those things and having the diversification is what folks look like. To be honest, you know, amongst our clients, what they tend to be interested in is a financial return as well. But something that's a bit out of fashion, but not for women today, is investing for positive impact. And there continues to be just a real interest in not only what will my money earn, but what types of things is my money being invested in and what type of impact I can have. And I know that's a little bit contrarian these days. And, and what are then the themes that are emerging in that, in that type of trade, in that, in that theme of impact as well? But again, we're not trading, so we are sure. investing yes. and we're there for the long term, which, by the way, every individual investor should. Um, you know, active trading tends to be a losing strategy for non-professional investors. I mean, how in the world you think you can know more than the markets do, know more than all of the portfolio managers out there do, know more than all the traders out there do, and that somehow, you know, you're going to watch you know, you're going to read up on something and just have an insight that everybody else missed so you can outperform the market, you know, is a fool's game. And so having that diversified investment portfolio really has been the winning strategy for individual investors for a long period of time. I think there's one significant, uh, perhaps years long event that, that you've been tracking in and anticipating the great wealth transfer. What do our viewers need to know about the great wealth transfer, the type of impact that that's anticipated to have? It's that most of uh, most of your viewers don't see it coming, that the great wealth transfer will occur as the boomers begin to pass away, um, as they begin to hit 80, 79, 80 this year. That money is going to go to millennials. It's going to go to Gen Z's. It's also going to go to women. And that's in part because women live six to eight years longer than men do. When you ask men who's going to benefit from the great wealth transfer, only a teens percent say it's women. Um, and the massive change here really cannot be underestimated as we have the feminization of wealth. As women have more money in their hands, they become more confident. Um, they use their money differently. They invest their money differently. They spend their money differently than men. Um, they give their money away to a greater rate uh, and tend to give it more to organizations that support women and girls. So we could see a massive shift here as the women's longevity does what Lean In and the other movements did not, which is get the majority of wealth in this country into the hands of women. And that is a trend worth betting on. Sally, just lastly, while we have you, is there one major theme or one major uh, perhaps campaign item or policy that we could hear leading up to the election that could shape uh, and securitize that great wealth transfer? Uh, well, look, I think finding ways for individuals to save more and invest more for retirement. 
uh, finding ways for uh, women to have more of a social safety net, uh, particularly as women have more money in their pockets. And it won't be this this presidential election, but in presidential elections to come, uh, giving money to and supporting politicians who support, um, you know, uh, policies that support women and their families. You know, if I could have one, it would be mandated paid parental leave, which pays for itself immediately. That's not you know, on the horizon anytime soon. But think about as women get more money and therefore donate more money to politicians, give more money, you could see this thing shift really dramatically over the years to come. Sally Krawcheck, LFS CEO, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance. We are just one week out from the launch of Wealth here on Yahoo Finance, hosted by my very wonderful colleague sitting right to the left of me, Brad Smith. So Brad, you have been putting so much time into the launch of the show. Give our viewers just a better sense of what they could be expecting. You know, you can expect a lot. Wealth is our brand new show airing daily between 11 a.m., 12 p.m. Eastern time. So there you got the times. And it's dedicated to personal finance here. We want to help the viewers really think about their financial situation and holistically having the best resources, building out a financial footprint. Major collaborative effort as well here, we should mention. Both of our teams at Yahoo Finance, some of the top names in personal finance outside of our doors, we're bringing them all in we're creating community as well here so that's more the broad picture tell us what we could expect more so on the day on a daily basis well first block of the show every day I mean we're really gonna focus on things called my money it's what it's gonna be called it's dubbed that we're gonna bring viewers the biggest news story of the day in the context of what it means for your money and if we were doing the show today so I might focus in on something like uh, what all investors are focused on the upcoming FOMC meeting and what it means for the timing of rate cuts and the markets but also we're focused on what it means for the spring home buying season here, too. We've had multiple conversations about that. How will the Fed's higher for longer rate stance impact the amount that you will pay for a house? So you can tune in for the premiere of Wealth, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday, March 25th. Everyone, this next week, set your countdown clocks on Instagram, on your Apple Watch, wherever you set countdown clocks. Next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time, and everyone should tune in because you've got to know what, how to make money, how to build your wealth, yeah. what the best way to approach it, and what these big events that we talk about every day on Yahoo Finance, what it means for you personally. And you're doing that in just an hour. If we're not helping people basis. set themselves up for 
uh, a cumulative growth uh, over their money and making sure that they're marching towards retirement and, hey, own like seven properties along the way. Why not? Then uh, we're not doing our job there. Just some of the little things that you could expect here at Yahoo Finance in the 11 a.m. hour. All right, well, that is not all. We've got another exciting event happening here at Yahoo Finance. And today we are bringing the brand new season of our next series. In our season premiere, we are diving into the huge challenge facing retailers, and that's theft. One solution is AI-powered technology that's aiming to stop crime before it happens. Be sure to tune in right here at 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time today to see the full story. Well, that does it for Brad and I, but keep it right here. Rochelle and Akiko have you for the next hour. We'll see you tomorrow.
Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Michelle Akufo alongside Akiko Fujita. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. Apple reportedly in talks with Google to use its generative AI engine Gemini on its iPhones. That's according to a Bloomberg report. What this means for both tech giants coming up this hour. And investors have high hopes for NVIDIA ahead of its 2024 GTC conference kicking off this afternoon. We're going to bring you the latest on the ground from San Jose, California. <clears throat> and shares of cosmetics company Elf have skyrocketed in recent years, up over 2,000% over the last five years. We'll speak to the CEO live from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange coming up later on in the show. First, though, let's take a look at where major indices are trading 90 minutes into the trading week. We've got green arrows across the board here. The Dow up 158 points, the S&P 500 up 58, and the Nasdaq, the biggest gainer on the day so far, up about 1.5%. Let's check in on the Treasury market ahead of that all-important Fed meeting later this week. We are seeing yields up here, the 10-year yield at 4.33%, and the 30-year yield at 4.45%. Well, one of the big stories we're watching today, Apple and Google reportedly teaming up yet again. According to a Bloomberg report, Apple is in talks to add Google's Gemini artificial intelligence engine to its iPhone. You see both stocks up in a big way on the back of that alphabet, getting the bigger bump up about 6.7 percent. Um, Rochelle, a number of things to, to point out here. Let's sort of take the Bloomberg report that's, you know, as it is here. Bloomberg reporting that Apple has, is developing its own AI capabilities for on-device AI, but they are looking to team up with Google for in-cloud AI. Now, there's a number of things to look at this. Number one, what does this mean from a regulatory perspective at a time where Google's partnership that already exists with Apple for search on devices is seen as anti-competitive? Certainly, you're going to have regulators step in, but also you have to wonder what this says about where Apple is in its own development of generative AI. A lot of analysts have kind of flagged this as a concern because they haven't necessarily seen the offerings from Apple. Tim Cook just last month saying that there is the potential for an incredible breakthrough for Gen AI, that the company is spending significant amounts of money. But this report today seems to suggest that Apple's a little further behind on this than maybe some investors had expected. I mean, it's true, but then you also have to wonder about Apple, you know, spreading itself too thin. As we saw, it, it pulled back on the idea of having, you know, the Apple car as well. I think they really are focused on the launch of the new updated iOS 18 operating system that's coming out this year. So this would be a good introduction if they are able to, to have this build on the search relationship they already have with Google to then incorporate Gemini, Gemini AI into the space here for some of the features on, it, on its newest iPhones. And you have to keep in mind also Samsung already launched its own Galaxy S24 line in January that already featured Gemini. So you have sort of a known quantity here, but also sources uh, listed in that Bloomberg article saying that Apple also in talks with OpenAI. So it could be some jockeying for position here. And as you mentioned here, obviously already potentially drawing the ire of regulators who already have questions about the dominance of Google and Apple when it comes to the search space here, as well as some of the lawmakers in the U.S. also clamping down on that as well. So something will continue to track, of course. Yeah, whatever comes with this, the, these features, uh, a lot of investors are expecting to be on that next iPhone. So we're going to be watching that one really closely. Well, investors have high hopes for NVIDIA ahead of its 2024 GTC conference kicking off this afternoon. We have seen analysts from Webbush, Truist, and HSBC all boosting their price targets on the stock as they anticipate big news spurring bullish sentiment in the days ahead. Joining us now with what he's hearing from analysts and those following NVIDIA closely is our very own tech editor, Dan Halley, who is on location for us today. Dan, what can we expect? Yeah, a lot of uh, AI hype obviously going into this. Akiko, uh, we're in San Jose. Uh, Jensen Huang, the uh, CEO of NVIDIA, will be speaking at a keynote today uh, starting at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. So you'll be able to uh, tune in to Yahoo Finance to get the latest on that. And I guess one of the big things that, that most are looking for is for NVIDIA to announce some kind of new AI chip, uh, a piece of hardware uh, that would be the successor to uh, its current H100 and H200 lines uh, of chips. Those are the, the hopper uh, chips. There's been talk of something called Blackwell. Uh, that could be the, the architecture, it could be uh, uh, the chip going forward. And you know the, the emphasis on AI is going to be 
huge for NVIDIA. Obviously, they've been talking about AI for years prior to the, the explosion we saw in 2022 uh, with the uh, announcement of, uh, or unveiling of ChatGPT to the public, but it's become all the more important as of late as more companies pile in. Uh, and with NVIDIA being the, the AI chip leader, uh, seeing some kind of big news out of this uh, is, is a must for them. And perhaps that plane uh, over there reflecting some of the sky-high uh, expectations here we have for NVIDIA. Um, do want to mention the U.S. restrictions that have limited the chips that NVIDIA and other semiconductor companies can sell to China. They've tried, really sort of trying to go around this with less powerful chips. Do you expect NVIDIA to make any announcements about the Chinese market? Yeah, I mean, look, that, that's something that's that's top of mind, I think, for, for a lot of investors. They originally had planned to release chips for the Chinese market. Uh, they had them ready to go. And then the U.S. said, no, even those are too powerful. Uh, uh, so now what they're going to have to do is come out with less powerful chips that can attract Chinese customers away from uh, the likes of, uh, you know, Huawei, uh, who's also developing its own chips. So there's there's the Chinese locals who are making their own chips now trying to appeal to companies over there. And then there's NVIDIA that's saying, well, look, we still have these chips that we can offer to you. Don't you want to get uh, in on this craze uh, with us? So NVIDIA is going to have to put something out that really gets that attention uh, of Chinese companies, even if it's not the best of the best that they have to offer. But you have to imagine uh, the local Chinese chip makers are going to go ahead and say, look, they don't have the, the best that they can uh, provide us here in China, but we do. So it, it's going to be a, a tough battle for them. And NVIDIA said, look, it's not going to hurt us, uh, our bottom line now, but it, it could represent uh, a missed opportunity in the future for us as far as revenue goes. So we'll, we'll have to see what they can roll out, if they roll out anything at GTC 2024. I know you'll stay on top of all of that for us there at their conference there. Appreciate you, as always, our very own Dan Howley. We're taking a look at stocks higher today as investors await the latest Fed decision on Wednesday. Investors are no longer anticipating a rate cut at this March meeting. So with that out of sight, what should they be focused on? We're joined by Eric Lynch, Sharf Investments Managing Director. Thank you for joining us this morning. So as we look at what some of the investors have been really mulling this week, we know obviously the AI push, keeping some of the rally elevated here, but also the Fed as well. If a rate cut is off the table here. What should we be focusing on at this meeting? Yeah, I think a, a rate cut's clearly off the off the table, uh, Rochelle, because you've got really these strong CPI, PPI prints, persistent strong job growth. Yes, things are slowing a bit in the economy, but it's still strong. And so I, there's there's really no reason for a rate cut uh, this week. Arguably, even next week, markets are really not pricing in the first rate cut uh, in terms of the highest probability until June. Uh, so I think what investors need to be looking at is what's the speed of, uh, of these rate cuts going forward and what's the timing. It looks like, you know, uh, heading into the, this, uh, this FOMC meeting, you had three cuts on the dot plot. We may see uh, that, that decrease to two. Um, you know, but I would argue that we're, at this point, we're kind of splitting hairs. Yeah, I mean, we've had analysts on who, who've sort of said, you know, just the timing of this doesn't necessarily matter. It is about, to your point, um, what that cycle looks like. I mean, are, are we expecting or are you expecting any significant move on the markets, you know, on the back of this meeting, just based on what Powell's likely to say? If we sort of get, you know, what has been uh, pretty much a consistent message from the Fed chair, seems like most of that's already been priced in. Yeah, I, I think that's right, Akiko. I, I, you know, it's, What's interesting, if you look at what's happening in the markets, at least the equity markets, you've seen a pretty strong rotation from the MAG7, the technology, U.S. mega caps, into just all sorts of different areas, cyclicals, financials, uh, international, small caps. And so what I think that is telling you, what investors are trying to tell us, are that, you know, we need to probably pivot our attention from the macro to the micro, start looking at earnings going forward. Because if you think about it, what's really driven the, the stock market in 2023, the S&P 500 was up 26%, profits were flat. And so now you take off immediate and substantial rate cuts off the table, then the eyes or the focus is going to be more on the economy and on earnings growth going forward. And I think that's what we need to start uh, focusing on in these you know, guidance going forward for 2024. 
So then, Eric, what would be some of the bellwethers that you look at when you're looking at the micro story that we got out of those Q4 earnings? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, it's it, it looks like it's earnings have improved, so that's good. Um, you know, even though they are flat for calendar 23, Rochelle, they were growing 3.4 percent year over year as we ended the year, guiding for something similar for Q1. I think what we need to see is just broad-based uh, margin improvement. Margins really contracted hard. Uh, if inflation's coming down, maybe you see some margin improvement in the consumer staples, things like that. Uh, hopefully, we get some service wage pressure off, uh, and you still and the service companies get better margin improvement. But those are things to be looking for. Um, and I think if if the economy stays kind of on this current two to three percent GDP trend, then again, you're talking about a broad-based economic growth. And I think you just want to be looking across a diverse set of stocks uh, in your portfolio, rather than a sober concentration on the big mega cap tech stocks names. Uh, finally, Eric, you know, we're talking so much about uh, this NVIDIA conference. Uh, we got Dan Halley in San Jose today. There's a lot of hope riding on these announcements. I see a big warning in your note that says, be aware of AI mania. What worries you there? Well, you know, look, I, I think... Uh, AI is for real, clearly. The use cases, which we're only beginning to discover now, are going to be pervasive and substantial. That's no doubt. But that's going to take a long time. Major technological innovation change takes a while for the productivity to uh, infiltrate the rest of the economy and be seen in, in profits across the board. And so because of that time, I think we need to be delineated between first derivative, second, third derivative AI plays. First derivative is clearly... NVIDIA providing the GPUs, um, you know, the hyperscalers uh, renting them out. And those guys, you see it reflected in their profits and their earnings. You know, G, uh, NVIDIA's year over year profit growth for Q4 was an eye popping 765%. Adobe last, uh, last Thursday reported investors were expecting this real substantial AI pop, didn't get it. Uh, growth was really still on par with what it was before. The AI, the AI introductions into its suite. And so yeah, I think what we need to do is just a wait and see attitude on the second root of stories going forward. But NVIDIA, I don't think there's anything to be worried about in the immediate future of the cloud hyperscalers as well. Clearly, there's way too much demand versus supply, and they're in good shape. And certainly, for the others, still in Eric that show and prove uh, state at the moment. Uh, we want to say a big thank you to Eric Lynch there, Sharp Investments Managing Director. Thank you for your time this morning. Thank you both. All right, coming up, it's Elf's 20th year trading at the New York Stock Exchange. We talk to the cosmetic company's CEO about their success next.
It's a jam-packed hour, focusing on the biggest movers and shakers on Wall Street. This is market domination, and here, every day is game day. We have one hour left until the market close. It's game time for investors to make their final plays. The clock is ticking, and we've got you covered with our quarter-by-quarter -quarter playbook. We're bringing you in on all the market action with step-by-step -step analysis of our biggest trending tickers. And expert insight into the day's biggest headlines. We'll bring you the closing bell and get you to the finish line. This is Market, market Domination. Domination. Tune in daily from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern. Well, shares of cosmetics company Elf have skyrocketed in recent years, up more than 2,000 percent over the last five years. This comes as the company has significantly boosted its marketing spend, citing the strong return on investment. And if you're on Instagram or TikTok, it is hard to go a day without seeing an Elf ad. Joining us now is Trang Amin, Elf Beauty CEO. It's good to talk to you today on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. Um, you know, this is a company that has seen some incredible momentum raising your guidance three times in a row. How much of that momentum is carried through in this current quarter? And I'm curious what you're seeing in consumer habits right now. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, we're really proud of our exceptional, consistent category leading growth. Uh, our last quarter, third quarter, we were up 85% net sales. That was our 20th consecutive quarter of growth, averaging at least 20% growth. And I'd say there's really three drivers of that, our exceptional value proposition, powerhouse innovation, and marketing engine. Uh, and all three are working together and it's really helping from a consumer standpoint. And Tarang, as you mentioned there, you know, been trading there at the, at the NICE for 20 years. What do you think was the turning point though, especially in the last five years, that's really seen the stock price skyrocket? Well, I think uh, the consistency of our growth is what I believe investors are rewarding us for. The level of growth we've been able to achieve, we've almost doubled our market share in just the last few years. But I think the more important thing is just how much white space we have ahead of us. Uh, we're the number three brand now in color cosmetics nationally, but at our longest standing national retail customer at Target, we're their number one brand with almost a 23% share. Uh, almost double where we are, more than double where we are nationally. In skincare, we have two incredible brands with Elf Skin and Notorium uh, to be able to pursue those aspirations. And internationally, in very many ways, we're just getting started with exceptional growth internationally as well. So I think it's that combination of consistent growth over the last five years combined with so much white space still ahead of us. As we said in the intro to you, um, you know, this is a brand that's been able to get a lot of traction with younger buyers, particularly um, with your ad spends, um, campaigns on social media. Um, we've been talking a lot about TikTok. Obviously, I'm not going to ask you to weigh in on what exactly DC is going to do, but I'm curious as you look across the platforms, what does TikTok offer to a brand like Elf in terms of exposure and getting to the customer that you want that other social media platforms do not? Well, I think, you know, the first of all, we live where our community lives. So our strength, the reason why we are a pioneer on TikTok, have our own channel on Twitch, actually have the number one branded experience right now on Roblox, is you look at what is engaging our community and what entertains them, and we go there. And so it's very native to each platform and authentic. And so I'd say one of the things TikTok brings to the marketplace is the ability of consumers to weigh in themselves. They're no longer necessarily dependent on influencers or their celebrities to tell them when we introduce something new, for example, our uh, $8 lip oils, uh, which compare to a prestige item at $40, 
we get thousands of TikTok videos almost immediately in terms of consumers making the comparison. So I'd say that's one of the things TikTok brings. But on the other hand, because we're so broad in our presence on different social media platforms, we'll continue to live where our consumers live. So if something ever happened to TikTok, we'll follow our consumers where do they go next. And I think that's really the strength of our platform. And Tarang, I know I certainly can't step into Target without my 10-year-old trying to steer me towards uh, the Elf brand uh, cosmetics over there, the, the skincare. But what does the next level of growth look like in terms of partnerships that you're looking at, or really tapping into the, the next <laughs> evolution of growth for Elf? Well, I think the next evolution of growth is continuing to execute our strategy, which we feel confident we can again double our market share in color cosmetics nationally. We feel skincare is an even bigger opportunity with Elf Skin and Notorium. And international, you know, international only represents 14% of our sales, where a lot of our global competitors have over 70% of their sales. And we're seeing really great resonance of the brand overseas, where there's almost already pent up demand from a consumer standpoint, well before we go into a market. So I think that's one of the most exciting things for me. Um, the company's 20 years old. I've been CEO for 10 years. Every time I get a new candidate, I tell them, you're joining us at exactly the right moment because we're just getting started. And I absolutely believe that. You mentioned international as a potential opportunity. You know, what are some markets that you see a significant upside for growth? Well, our primary international business right now is really off of two countries, Canada and UK, the first two countries we went into. We continue to build share, continue to build our ranking. But one of the exciting things for me is just a few months ago, we launched the brand with Douglas in Italy and quickly became their number one brand, not only on the mass side, but on their prestige side. And again, it speaks to that phenomenon of a lot of our social feed is actually consumed outside the US. So there's already pent up demand. So I'd say all of Western Europe, we have a good business with Nika, an online beauty retailer in India. Really, we, I, we see opportunities across the world, but we'll have this focused, disciplined expansion strategy, which I have a lot of confidence in. And Tarang, even within the, the ranks of ELF, one of the, the pillars that you mentioned there in your notes is purpose. Talk about why that's important, especially as you see some companies really not prioritizing that, but you see a lot of consumers wondering who it is I'm buying from. Why did you decide to prioritize that? Well, we prioritize it because it's important to our community, it's important to our employees. You know, we we're one of the first mass brands that not only offered premium quality at these accessible price points with broad appeal, but we we're one of the first ones that was clean, vegan, cruelty-free, and the only beauty company that's fair trade certified. And the reason why we've done all those things is that's what our community values. And so it's really important for us as our purpose, if we stand with every eye, lip, face, and paw, is we really want to make sure that we're enabling people to express themselves, for people to empower and embody our ethics, and it's working. It definitely resonates with our community, and they in turn reward us in terms of not only the products they buy, but the company that they love. It certainly appears to be working. Appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Tarang Amin, Elf Beauty CEO, thank you for your time today. Thank you. All right, we've got all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Yahoo Finance's Wealth is your guide, your group of advisors, planners, and jargon busters to help you save, build, and grow your money. How do I know if I'm saving enough for retirement? How do I know if it's right for me to go on that lavish vacation? Is it finally time to refinance my mortgage? How do I pay less in taxes? We'll get you the answers you need. Well, earning it, growing it, and managing it. It's more than tracking just the latest market moves. It's more than your favorite trending pictures. One does not simply build wealth without considering the entire financial landscape. It takes a community, and we've built one for you. Wealth cuts through the noise to help guide your financial decisions so that your money works for you. Wealth on Yahoo Finance premieres March 25th. Well, Fisker shares are plunging today, down more than 12% there. This comes after more bad news for the EV maker. The company announcing it is pausing car production and looking to raise $150 million. To break this down for us, we've got our very own Praz Subramanian. Oof, Praz, you look at that stock move. I mean, it, we're talking 15 cents a share at this point, right? Six-week pause. What does that buy Fisker, and is that enough time to get their finances in order? Well, I think it's bought itself some breathing room here with this $150 million of new funding uh, coming from an existing investor to be doled out uh, across four different tranches. And then also, uh, according to some sort of conditions need to be need to be hit, in particular, filing that 10K that's been delayed. So I think that's that's the positive here. The bad news, like you mentioned, is that um, the company has paused production now for six weeks uh, to kind of, they say, better align with demand. They had produced around 1,000 vehicles uh, this year and have 4,700 vehicles in inventory. So they have a bit of supply there to kind of go through. Um, the company also reiterated to Kiko that it's in talks with a large manufacturer, again, uh, for a potential transaction or partnership. Last week, Reuters had said that it would could be Nissan. That's who they were talking to. Uh, we'll see. But yeah, I think outside of, an, of a partnership or new fundraising or something positive, it's going to be hard here for Fisker to, um, you know, keep its shareholders happy here who have seen a, lot, a massive decline in value. And I think the company is is trying to keep going here. And we'll see what happens with this new new funding and potentially uh, a partnership. And we know, Pras, that we've talked about production delays uh, plaguing Fisker before, but also some on the good side, the things that it does have going for it, it's intellectual property. How well positioned do you think it is then for some of these car makers that you've mentioned there to take Fisker on? Well, according to Reuters, there was talk that Nissan was interested in some of the other uh, Fisker's other platforms. For instance, they have a uh, an EV pickup coming in the future and a couple other smaller vehicles. I think that's sort of what was exciting to them. You know, Nissan is sort of, I don't want to say they're rebooting here, but they've their, their current Aria EV is not sold that well. And they've been offering extensive discounts and incentives to move those cars off a lot. So potentially they see this as an exciting way to amp up their EV offerings, which, they, which I think and I think many automakers believe might be a little hiccup here with EV demand, but potentially it's going to go that way in the future, uh, mid-decade and a decade. That's where we see more of these sales. So Fisker does have some value there in terms of their um, intellectual property. And plus they have, like I said, 4,700 EVs in, in, in inventory, which the company says is worth around $200 million. We'll certainly see if we, they can get into the hands of uh, some ego buyers, perhaps. I appreciate you getting us up to speed there, our very own Pras Supermanian. Thanks. Well, staying in the EV space, Blink charging shares trading to the downside today. This comes after a mixed earnings report last week, the company reducing its full-year 2024 guidance, but reporting a 130% growth in its 2023 revenue. A tough year for the company so far, though, its stock losing over 17%. To break down what's next for the company, we have Brendan Jones, Blink charging CEO. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. So I want to dig into the earnings a little bit first here. How much sure. of that is a product of the, the macro environment and, and some of the, you know, some of the decisions that we've seen the major car makers making in terms of pulling back on some of their EV commitments? Well, first, we have to recontextualize our earnings. Uh, we, we were up considerably over well over 100 <laughs> percent. So Blink has actually experienced exponential growth from 22 to into 23. And in fact, we, we even saw a EV increase. Last year, the automotive sector for EVs in the U.S. finished at 8% uh, pen rate versus new vehicles sold. And in California, that was 25. 
in February, we saw it hit almost 10 percent. So while there's a lot of news stories out there, it's still we're still seeing growth across the segment. And then Blink, of course, has shown exponential growth, uh, highest revenue uh, target at, at over $140 million. And we believe that we're going to continue to grow in 2022. It might not be at the same level, and there might be a little bit of a slowdown in the growth factor, but overall, the industry is and will continue to grow. I mean, Blink is a is is uniquely positioned to to really be able to see, you know, where a lot of your clients are, are expecting EVs to go, whether it is in the investment in the chargers, when it's in the manufacturing. Um, what are you finding in that right now? Yes, things EV transition is still happening, but we are seeing a rate of adoption slowing. Is that affecting the investments clients are making in these chargers? And no, not at this time. So again, you know, eight percent moving up to nine percent. We also operate uh, fairly significantly in Europe as well, where we're seeing twenty, thirty, and and forty percent. EV penetration rates across the countries we're active in. Uh, five in one electric vehicles, that was the ratio globally. That's going to improve over time as well. So there's a lot of news stories. You see individual automakers that are contracting, others that are looking to expand. Uh, so we don't see it. Now, what's also happening is that the different fields are expanding. So while the consumer segment, which is primarily passenger uh, cars, the fleet segment is on fire, and in terms of charging, we're seeing a lot of activity now finally penetrating multifamily dwellings, uh, apartment buildings, garage-based infrastructure, and those are the segments that are growing the fastest for EV charging right now. And Brendan, I do want to ask you about this strategic shift from direct sales to a dealer partnership model, uh, most recently expected to expand in, in Rockville, Maryland, not too far from uh, here in D.C. Talk about that decision to make that shift and, and how you see that really impacting the, the greater ecosystem for Blink. Well, Blink is a we, we're the most versatile company out there. Uh, if you want to buy a charger from us, we no problem. You want us to provide network services? We do that. If you want us to come on your property and own and operate the charger and derive our income uh, from the kilowatt sales, we'll do that as well. So it's more diversification for Blank. We're the guys that walk in and we always have a solution for whatever CITOS it is, no matter what. We don't give up revenue. We provide a solution and we custom tailor that solution to whatever our CITOS or clients needs are. Uh, Brendan, I want to get back to your comment about multifamily units and where you're seeing growth there, because for so long, when you look at the charging landscape, I mean, that has been a huge void when so many Americans actually live in apartments in multifamily units. I mean, how much growth are you anticipating there? And are we still talking about, you know, level two, expecting that these are drivers who want to just be charging overnight? Yeah, and according to most of the data out there, and this is from McKinsey Price. Waters, Cooper House, Bloomberg's, just to name a few, over 90% of the kilowatts that are going to deploy are going to be at level two charger. So that's the charger, no matter what we hear. But, you know, in the U.S., the share of voice is towards the D.C. fast charger when the workhorse is actually level two. Now, what we have to redefine in this industry is what the home is. And the home is not a single family home. The home is a condo. The home is an apartment building. The home is where someone lives. Now, working in collaboration with state and federal government uh, and local municipalities, we're beginning to get legislation in place to penetrate condo associations, garage-based infrastructure. Even in some states, now it's mandated. If you're going to repave or relight your garage, you have to add a certain percent of EV infrastructure to that. More legislation and cooperation is needed on a state and local level to drive this. But these are the vehicles of the future. So we need to do the structural adjustment to, uh, today to be able to reap the rewards later on. And Brenda, just quickly, I want to ask about AI investments that, that Blink is looking at. Everything from sort of customer prediction of where those needs are going to be, um, in, even in terms of the pressure that it puts on the grid in certain places. What sort of investments is Blink making in that space? So we have our, our CTO working hard on this topic, as many other companies do uh, right now as well. So the first investment is going to be on the customer satisfaction side, both on the service side and the reaction time 
to making sure we're serving our customers best when either they call in for a problem or we need to roll a check to a truck to service a charger in the field. This is going to be the first step. Then we'll take AI from the sales and marketing and how to be more responsive to our customer in terms of communications and identifying early trends of where chargers need to be. And that's that's the step we're actively working on. And we'll even have some announcement. We'll bring you some third party players on that to help us get it right. Yeah, AI is certainly going to be key to also ensure that the grid isn't uh, strained as a result of more charging. Um, Absolutely. Great well. conversation there, Brenton Jones. Always good to talk to you. Blink Charging CEO, appreciate your time today. Absolutely. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Well, coming up, we've got more live coverage from Sarah Week, including a conversation with S&P Global CEO, Doug Peterson. That's coming up on the other side. You're watching Yahoo Finance. I'm Julie Hyman here in Houston, Texas at the Sarah Week by S&P Global Conference. It is the big annual gathering for the oil and gas industry. And as we talked about earlier, they're talking about all kinds of themes, the energy transition, the, all the M&A that's been going on, AI, of course. I'm here with the uh, CEO of the host of the conference, S&P Global, Douglas Peterson is here with me. Great, Julie, thanks for being here, but especially thanks for being here for Sarah Week. You're gonna yeah. have a fantastic opportunity I'm to be very with so many people. 
Um, so talk to us about what you see as some of the big themes of the conference and what you're more, most excited to hear about as you're here. You mentioned oil and gas, and traditionally this was an oil and gas conference. It goes back over 40 years. But over the last few years, it's transitioned into a conference about energy transition. And the themes are, some people are going to talk about molecules, about hydrogen and how things are changing, energy transition. But this is a real conference about revolution, about innovation, and how the energy landscape is going to look many, many years going forward. Now, you guys help measure how that is all working, right? You have different scores for companies, your data company, and there was a, a, a new rule that was proposed by the Securities and Exchange Commission to try to improve transparency and reporting, some new reporting requirements put on companies having to do with climate. A court actually just paused the uh, implementation of that rule on Friday. But I'm curious what your view is. Do you think that it's a good idea and is it helpful? I think it's a really good idea to have consistent standards. And first of all, I'm going to say globally. There's an organization called the International Sustainability Standards Board, the ISSB, that is looking at ways to have consistent standards for disclosure about climate action around the globe. And the U.S. needs to get on board. And the U.S. actually is a member of the ISSB, which comes from the IFRS. So I was encouraged that the rule that came out was one where both the environmentalists and some of the others were against it, it means that maybe they're starting to hit the right, the right uh, balance on it. But we need to have something that allows us to have disclosure. By the way, about 85% of the companies in the S&P 500 are disclosing climate, disclo climate disclosure today. They have it in a report, might be called a climate report or an impact report or something like that. So this is going to allow to have consistency, transparency, comparability, which would all be great for the markets. And when you look at the energy industry in particular, you know, and I know S&P gives sort of ESG scores to every company. A lot of the companies here are talking about the energy transition and what they're doing. Are they actually doing it? How far along are we? Well, this is something why we're here for this conference to understand that. And one of the things that we're measuring is a company's ability to meet their, their uh, transition promises. Uh, many companies have put out a 2030, a 2040, a 2050 target, and we want to see are they going to have the ability to meet those targets. And that's going to be one of the discussions here in this, con in this conference. Um, how helpful has the IRA been in terms of helping spur um, changes there, helping spur money flowing into some of these new technologies also? Well, the IRA is bringing a level of infrastructure investment that we hadn't seen in the United States for a long time. And it's going to allow this concentration, concentrated investment go into energy transition. And it's some of the areas that are difficult to get to, batteries, uh, new types of metals that are needed, hydrogen. Hydrogen is something that's going to have an opportunity, in, especially in the southwest, th this area of the country, because of the sun, because of the energy that's here. And so the IRA is bringing a massive amount of investment from around the globe. Uh, things like uh, ba uh, batteries uh, for, for different types of energy sources. So the IRA is, is a really important initiative in the U.S. How important is this election for the energy transition? And are we seeing sort of uh, an outcome where it's going to look very different depending on who wins the presidency? I don't think it will look that different. Well, first of all, there's over 4 million people around, 4 billion people voting around the world this year. There's elections going on all the time. I don't think that it's going to have that big of an, of an impact on the energy transition story. I, I believe that the IRA will be here to stay. I don't see any reason why that would change no matter what the outcome of of the election, but energy transition and climate is on every single person's mind. I can't have a meeting where we don't talk about it. Uh, you mentioned AI at the very beginning. That's another one of the themes. Interest rates. You know, there's a few themes that every meeting I go to, we talk about those. But energy transition is on everybody's minds. People are starting to build energy transition plans. That's not going to change because of the election. But are your clients asking you for advice on how to prepare for, specifically here in the U.S., each eventuality? Well, we're not consultants, so we're not giving advice. We're providing transparent, consistent data which so people can make informed decisions. But in maybe more informal conversations, we talk a lot about the elections and what some of the different impacts could be. But I really don't think in the energy business that, that the election will have that big of an impact because com companies are already moving and they're moving fast. And then finally, just quickly on AI. I know you um, participated in a panel on this very topic. What's the biggest change that AI is bringing 
to energy? Because it's not necessarily something that people think of right away when they think about AI is the energy industry. Yeah, the AI is going to bring an opportunity to completely rethink the way you use data and the way you can project forward how different technology is going to be used for the energy transition. In addition, it's going to be very valuable for the part that's difficult for any transition is the financial impact. There is trillions of dollars needed to invest and finance the energy transition. And AI is going to also help with that to find the most promising investments, the most promising approaches to energy. But I think when you go to this molecule approach that some people are talking about, you also be able to apply AI to some of that kind of study as well. But big compute, AI are going to be advantage is going forward as well for the energy transition. Doug, thank you so much. Great to thank see you. Thank you so much. It's Doug, great to be here. Yeah, thanks. Doug Peterson, CEO of S&P Global. Much more Yahoo Finance after this. Supreme Court arguments are now underway in a case to decide when government pressure to remove social media posts violates Americans' First Amendment right to free speech. Now, the case stems from the Biden administration's efforts to influence social media posts concerning COVID-19 vaccinations. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan to tell us more. An interesting test of free speech and influence in the digital age here. Yes, and not the Supreme Court's first this year. It's taking up this case. It's about First Amendment speech protections for companies, for individuals. And they're talking about when the government puts pressure on social media to remove posts that were posted by users. Now, on one side of this case, you have state attorneys general from Missouri and Louisiana, and also five private users of Facebook, 
X, YouTube, on the other side, you have the Biden administration. And this all arose back during the pandemic when the Biden White House, along with the CDC, the FBI, uh, the Surgeon General's office, as well as a cybersecurity agency, they asked these social media companies to remove posts concerning COVID-19, anti-vaccination uh, information, also uh, election information. And they're saying that those expressed views that the White House considered harmful. Now, the states and the users, they say that that pressure from the administration converted the social media companies into state actors. They say that the posts that they were censored there, that the social, social media companies basically turned into state actors because they did it at the government's direction. Now, the states wrote in their brief this. They said the administration's officials complain that the government must be allowed to speak freely. That flips the First Amendment, they say, on its head. The government can speak freely on any topic, they say, but cannot pressure and coerce private companies to censor ordinary Americans. Now, the Biden administration, I want to read to you their argument. Here's how they put it. They say, so long as the government seeks to inform and persuade rather than to compel, its speech poses no First Amendment concern, even if government officials state their views in strong terms, and even if private actors change their speech or conduct in response to those requests. Now, the lower courts here, they mostly ruled in favor of the states and the social media users who put up those posts. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals originally issued an injunction that stopped the White House from conducting these kinds of communications with the social media companies, but the Supreme Court, once it decided to take up this case, they put all that on hold. So that is what is currently being argued in the court, arguments still going on as we speak. Ladies? Certainly an interesting line there between persuasion and coercion there, especially if you're a government official, uh, considering that pressure there. I appreciate you breaking all that down for us. Our very own Alexis Keenan. Let's get your final check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. Still looking at green across the board, although some volatility um, for all major indices here. We're looking at the Dow currently still up, though, about 150 points or 0.4 percent. The S&P 500, all sectors in the green there, currently up about 44 points on the day. NASDAQ pushing ahead the highest here, up about 187 points or just over 1 percent. And of course, investors bracing for what we'll hear as the FOMC meeting kicks off on Tuesday. And we get that a bit more color on how the Fed is thinking on Wednesday as well. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Akufo alongside Akiko Fujita. Thanks for watching Yahoo Finance.